I knew I just I was like, we have three seconds to live. Like I'm going to die in three seconds. And the three seconds just kept coming. So in 2010, one morning, I went to go meet my buddy Casey Neistat and we were going for a run. And he mentions this project that he got us to do where it was a series of videos where they would pair up a director with a fine artist. And, you know, it was a series of portraits of fine artists and their work. And uh, he was like, hey, I'm doing this thing. You know, would you would you be into it? And I was like, yeah, that sounds awesome. You know, like, I'll, I love Casey's work. I'll, I just say yes to anything he proposes. And uh, so I was like, yeah, let's do it. What, uh, what should we do for this video? And we've seen portraits of artists before, and it's usually the same thing where it's, you know, you interview the artist about their work and their inspiration, and then you cut to showing the process of them making the work. And then you cut to, you know, a gallery exhibition or you, you show the finished product. And I had done that before and I was really, I th we were both on the same page. I'm like, whatever we do, it's got to be not that. Like we have to figure out what the opposite direction is and just go that way as hard as we can. And it was at a time in my career when I was really trying to figure out what my relationship with tattooing was because I had gained some momentum in my fine art career and tattooing itself was going through a big shift. You know, it, it had kind of gotten hijacked by reality TV and mall culture and, you know, all of a sudden soccer moms were getting tattoos and I love tattooing and I fell in love with tattooing when it was this kind of you know, underground, special craft and community. And I didn't want to be the old guy that was sitting there like grumbling and complaining that things are changing. But at the same time, I, I found myself really trying to connect with and do tattoos that had real emotional value, you know, because I, I just felt like a lot of it was about the aesthetic. And I was like, I want to tattoo people that have a real emotional need for the tattoos I put on them. And that sort of craving drove me to tattoo in some, you know, unconventional environments. I, I did a project where I went down to Mexico City and tattooed inmates at Santa Marta Penitentiary down there and really got a lot out of that, you know, just, just really connecting with the inmates and, you know, getting to understand what was meaningful for them you know like in, in that scenario like what was what was useful to carve into their arm and you know I uh so I was telling Casey about the prison project you know he had heard about it a little bit I was like we should do something like that for this video and we were tossing ideas back and forth and it's like oh what if what if we tattooed soldiers at the front lines of a war you know on the front like fighting at the front of a conflict the intensity of that situation would inevitably provide just some raw human emotion. And, you know, like if I offer people the chance to get tattooed in that moment, what would they get? I, I definitely wouldn't be meaningless tribal armbands. No offense to tribal armbands. Anyway, we said that idea out loud. And eight days later, I found myself on a plane in full body armor landing at Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan. And as I'm looking out at the vastness of this military installation, it doesn't dawn on me until then that I don't even know why we're in Afghanistan. I mean, I don't know why the U.S. is there. I don't know who we're fighting. I don't know why we're fighting them. I just felt this wave of naive awe and really was struck by the fact that I had no idea what we were doing there. I'm Scott Campbell. This is the Stupid Things for Love podcast. And today I'm sitting down with retired Master Sergeant Roger Sparks. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, it's really cool in here. Oh, it feels great in here. Right, perfect. So I'm in the backyard of Roger Sparks here in Alaska in a little wooden shack of a sauna that he's built. And this sauna has become sort of this unspoken social club amongst the PJs. There's a lot of kind of camaraderie and getting together that happens here through the long Alaskan winters. Bulldog Bite. I know it's a story you've told before, but I wanted to see if you'd be into walking through like the week before we met. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, the week before that we met, I was in charge of a group of men and we were tasked with attempting to save the lives of American troops that were raiding insurgent training camps on the border of Pakistan, Afghanistan, up in the northern area. And we were saving their lives uh, utilizing helicopters and techniques that uh, were really audacious. You know, it's really just flying into the middle of a firefight and hoisting down into the middle of it and trying to mitigate the risk just to try to put our hands on humans that are dying and get them to surgical teams that could save their lives. And this is all happening in a very surreal way. Um, and you guys, your unit is different than like medevac or other stuff because you, normally in those situations, the, I don't know the different names, but, but they would wait until the conflict is resolved and then go in and yeah, pull people yeah, out. But uh, you guys are going in there in the middle of a conflict. Yeah, my job and the men that I was as leading in this situation, uh, we were pararescuemen. Some of those highly trained, highly selected, most physically capable, you know, men in, in the special operations world. You know, I mean, it's a very arduous process to become a pararescueman. And to be asked to do what we're doing, it's very, it's metaphysical. People shooting at you firing RPGs at you, and you're coming in on a giant flying Winnebago that's going to hover above this whole situation. And you're basically being asked to solve unsolvable problems with your will, you know, with your mortality and your will, just risking everything to try to get to people and make the impossible happen. You know, people that are, you know, horrific, mutilating injuries, and you're trying to save their lives, you know. So you're going in and rescuing these people, what was their objective? Like, what were they doing there? You know, generally pararescuemen are there just to save lives or recover sensitive items. Uh, they're kind of like the, when coalition troops or special operations teams get in a bad situation, I, you know, th them, things don't go their way, they're dying, they'll call pararescue in to try to mitigate and salvage life out of that situation. And uh, the particular week before we, we met, there was an operation called Bulldog Bite to Charlie. It was an army operation. Army is really big into bulldogs, that's like their mascot. And so they give these kind of cheesy names to everything. Like when you work with Marines, it's always snakes, like Cobra, Everything's like serpentine. And, and so they have names to these things. But basically what these men were asked to do, there was 250 men from uh, the 101st Airborne uh, to Ranger Battalion. I think there was a SEAL team involved in this later on during the week. There was a, a couple ODA team, which are Green Beret teams uh, stationed out of Asadabad that were on a QRF, like a quick reaction force involved in this. But the mission was to raid insurgent training camps up at high altitude in the mountains, above 7,000 feet, so like 8,000 feet in, in big CH-47 helicopters. They're going to get dropped off, and they're basically going to patrol down the mountain. And as they're moving down the mountain, they're going to find people that shoot at you. And those are obviously the enemy when they're shooting at you. And so... Uh, like that's all you can tell. <laughs> yeah, it, it's they call it reconnaissance by fire. Like you are there in your right. presence, in your, you know, ideology, and you being there is going to create an invoker response. And when that happens, then, you know, you react to that as well. And so there was intel that was, there was known training camps. So like, think of like the Al-Qaeda 
or the Taliban at the time, you know, working to kill coalition forces in Afghanistan, this is where they train their commandos. This is like an elite kind of thing within them. U.S. forces hadn't been through that area for some time. I forget the amount of time, but so the, the, the enemy had kind of like a freedom of movement. And just also background to, that I think is very relevant to someone listening to this with naive ears. Like Alexander the Great was like one of the last forces that was ever there, you know, from the outside, you know, and he, they couldn't tame that place. In they, that they, they basically <laughs> left and were like, we can't conquer this area. And is that because of terrain or? I think just... it's a mix, you know, isn't it interesting how like the terrain changes the ideology and the persona of its people. And these people are rugged. These people are tough. They are fierce mountain fighters. And, you know, I really respect them as warriors. You know, like some of these people are brutally tough, you know, and there's a big difference between Southern Afghanistan and Northern Afghanistan. You know, it's a very vast country and Northern Afghanistan is as rugged as it gets. And the altitudes at which we're attempting to do these operations are at the limits of the equipment and technology that we're dealing with. And so, for instance, you know, like a Pavehawk helicopter, it's a very overburdened aircraft whenever you apply it to combat because not only the fuel, the equipment, the men, the armament that's on the aircraft or the bulletproof flooring, all these things weigh a lot. And the higher in altitude you go, the lower performance the aircraft becomes. And so we're dealing with altitudes that are at the limits of that aircraft to even perform in those things. And so, for instance, us trying to save men at those altitudes with the aircraft that we were using, we couldn't put bulletproof flooring in the aircraft. Or because we, of the weight. The weight of it. Yeah. And so we would have to limit the ammunition that we're bringing. They would have to limit the fuel to even fly to those altitudes. So our loiter times would be reduced from an hour to we've got 20 minutes to make this shit happen or it's not going to happen. Or you only have half the ammunition that you would normally bring. So if everybody's shooting at you, you can't just shoot at everybody. You have to really focus on who you're returning fire to, to mitigate the threat. And so everything is at the kind of lunatic fringe of possibility. So the coalition forces were there to seek out and destroy these insurgent training camps. And this really had never been done in this area. And so basically they're trying to go kill or capture the people that are training insurgents or the insurgents themselves that are being trained. Yeah. And we've done, we had done many of these things up until this point. I mean, you have to understand, like, again, this is even before the week that, that you and I met, um, we had done maybe five or six operations like this. And they're, they're always somewhat benign. Like, But in the specific region, like there have been no attempts to kind of disturb, even disturb them in that, so they get comfortable. Like, yeah. yeah, like this is their. They were dug in deep. Yeah, this is their kind of vacation spot. Like nobody's coming there. Yeah, there would be trails, literal like trails going through the mountains that you could just see, and you would see donkeys laden with munitions, like RPGs, wow. PKMs, dishkas, like every Soviet leftover you could imagine. And these donkeys are loaded to the point of breaking. And they're just riding up and down these things in like covered wagons, just hauling war materials from Pakistan into Afghanistan. And these were like well-traveled routes and they're doing it in plain day. Yeah. And so when we would see that, it, it, that's, that's just an indicator of how these people in this place, this was their nest. This and there was, was a sense that that that, that area was was impenetrable like Correct. like you couldn't touch it like that sure. was that was the place that like americans couldn't touch them yeah this is kind of like the ho chi minh trail like yeah. to use a vietnam analogy you yeah know? so so there's this big operation that's going in to raid these training camps walk me through the specifics of of how that unfolded yeah so they basically give us a specific time and we'll fly the helicopters in at the time in Afghanistan, there's FOBs or forward operating bases all over there. There's small little Alamo outposts all over Afghanistan. So you guys are pre-positioned there and half your team is out there at FOB Joyce for the start of Bulldog Bite. And you and the other guys are back in Bagram. Ah, shit. You hit, you hit in the head. Uh, 
I got a call. I, I was doing a workout with all my gear. And I get a call, hey, uh, Jimmy's been shot in the head. That, that was the first that I even heard of it. You know, and, and uh, things get kinetic, you know, like, I mean, you're like, oh, okay, you know, like they're taking fire or, you know, something. And a lot of it, you know, we have, it's professional to a point where at the moment when things are happening, you only convey things that matter, that, that matter of relevance. It's not like, oh my gosh, OMG, there's none of this like, None, it's, it's very practical. Give me just what matters so I can interact with the information or the reality that's right. taking place. I, that's all I want is information that allows me to interact properly with the reality that's happening. And so you get basically situation reports back of what's going on. We have all this different feed that tells us the missions that are being flown. But on the first mission of Bulldog Bite, when I say first mission, what I mean is the first uh attempt at responding to a nine line. A nine line is, is, a, is a report that basically says someone's injured and they need to be recovered. They, they need, you know, they're, they're not helping us. You need to get them off the battle space. And so the first nine line we received, the PJs took off in a helicopter and they received fire and they received ground fire and the bullets went through the helicopter and struck one of the PJs in the head. And, uh, so they're just like, Jimmy's been shot, the aircraft's mechanically down, ongoing operations, and they're doing it single ship. And so it gets a little into the tactics and techniques, but you need two aircraft to effectively recover injuries from the battle space. One, because it's extremely dynamic as one aircraft comes in to hover. And again, this is all extremely high altitude and you're hoisting up and down. You're not landing a helicopter. This is, It's too rugged. It's very, very steep mountains. And so... So everybody's going up and down a rope, yeah. Yeah, you're going up and down a steel cable that's a quarter inch thick, uh, 30 or 40 feet, because the, the, the sides of the, the mountain are so steep. And so it becomes very challenging. Uh, you need another helicopter to fly overhead and provide cover. It's like that whole kind of analogy of like, two is one, one is none. Like you have to have backup because you're... No, no man is an island in that situation. Like if you're just one person, will then that one thing is really not effective. You know, like two people can have the power of ten people if yeah. you use, but one person is one person. But yeah, back to bulldog bite. So, uh, so I you get, get there, the called Jimmy's got Jimmy shot. Jimmy's in the been head. shot, and it's yeah. so immediately is like, is it like I'm like, did it penetrate his skull? Because, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, it may sound very, very intense. Oh, he's shot in the head. Well, there's, and again, as a pararescue man, uh, someone who specializes in, in trauma, specifically combat trauma, immediately, is it penetrating or is it, because a lot of times, you know, the, the skull is really thick. And so you can get shot a lot or hit with shrapnel or spalding and it just spins around your skull. It doesn't penetrate. And, but again, they're in this austere setting. They're like, He's semi-conscious. We believe it hasn't penetrated his skull. And so, okay, so that's just gee whiz, like I love Jimmy. Thank you. But what's more important is now they're a man down. The operation is not stopping because Jimmy got shot. Yeah. And to be honest, like I was like, all right, this is real now. Like, okay. And I'd had a chip on my shoulder all of my pararescue career because I went from being a very senior Marine recon guy to a junior pararescue man. And when you do that, like, there's a lot of caveats that, like, like my opinion doesn't matter. Just shut up. And and so now I was like, okay, well, I happen to be in charge, and this is as real as it's going. This is very real now. Like, one of our men is injured, potentially a fatal wound. We don't, we don't, we're not sure. So immediately we go into tailspin of like, how are we going to backfill immediately? Because the distance in helicopter to us being to where they're at is a three-hour flight. Wow. You know, and that's hauling ass. That's that's flying full tilt just to get there to help out. And but also the bigger thing, even on top of Jimmy being injured, is they're still flying missions, but now they're doing it with one helicopter and they don't have the parts to fix the other helicopter. So again, we fly with our own mechanics and shit like that. And so they need to identify what part needs to get replaced. And we need to go and find that shit and fly it because we don't, there's not a fucking warehouse you fly around with. So we have to go f access that part and get it 
not only there to fix the helicopter, so we're going to bring a helicopter, we're going to bring more PJs, we're going to bring fucking flamethrowers and all kinds of shit, and we need to bring these helicopter parts and more mechanics because shit just got real. Yeah. This was the first, within the first like 12 hours of Bulldog Bite taking place. Right. We flew to the warehouse of parts on Bagram. We couldn't find the people that would let us in the warehouse, so we, we caved the door into the, the hangar to go get the parts. I'm in full, you know, PJ battle rattle, NVGs and the whole night. We can't even figure out how to turn on the lights in the warehouse. <laughs> so you have night vision goggles looking Just through the parts find this racks. Part because kind of that's in between us and going to help yeah. our team. After we kicked open the door, you know, like then we, I realized I don't know what we're finding. I go back out and I grab the, the mechanic and I'm like, come in here and help me find this shit. And, I look the, the mechanic in the eyes is like, this will fix what they're saying is wrong with it. I'm like, anything else, let's just grab it now. And yeah. so we literally have tool chests, like snap on roller bin tool chest and all these parts and everything that, you know, I'm going to go take for my death. You know, like you just, you yeah. pile in the helicopter. And so we got to go fly three hours and you're stuffed in there like fucking sardines, man. Like imagine 12 people in the back of an Astro van, like a minivan. I mean, you're just yeah. you're piled in there with all these parts and, and as we're doing this, they're still telling us what's going on. Like it's like operations are continuing, but we yeah, get you're moving it. slow, but fireflies happen it's fast. It's still happening. Yeah. It, all this shit's still happening. And so we landed at Jalalabad, which is a refueling point because we're flying to the extent of the aircraft running out of fuel. Yeah, with we get all more that fuel. weight and parts. Yeah, and, and then we get re more fuel, and then we take off again to go to uh, Asadabad, Water Per Valley area. And uh, anyway, we land. It's probably like 11 o'clock or midnight local time. Then we walk across like 30 yards from the helicopters to like an aid station, but it's inside a compound. This is an Alamo. Every night this place receives mortar fire, rockets. It, it, this is not a safe place to be, but it's on the edge of the battle space of what we're doing. And that's where we have to preposition ourselves to affect that life rescue. And so anyway, so... I walk in and the first person that I meet was Brandon Stimke. And he's a dear friend of mine. We've been PJs together for a very long time at this point. I trust him. He's quite a character, you know, and I look into his eyes and, you know, in Vietnam, they used a term, it's, uh, have you seen the tiger smile? Wow. And it's like, when you've seen the beast, you know, like when you have been confronting your own mortality, you take on a specific look. I mean, think of someone who's standing at the gallows. Like there's something animalistic in that. Yeah. I just looked at him and, I, and he just, he kind of teared up and started crying. And he's sitting in an aid station on his gear, covered in blood, covered in dust. Because I mean, our job is to work underneath helicopters in combat. And so you get really dirty. Think of Dune. You know, yeah. a dune stand, sandstorm, you know, like with people shooting at you. And so, like, he, his eyes almost look like they're bleeding, like crying blood yeah. in his eyes. Like, they're so bloodshot and he's so beside himself. Like, that 10,000-yard stare has been used before. And it's very much so all over my buddy Brandon Stimke. And, and uh, so I just leaned down, man, and I kind of gave him a, a squeeze. And I'm like, where's Jimmy, man? I might, have, I might have made some small tech, like, how are you doing? What's going on? But I mean, you could, it's yeah. palpable. And again, these guys are on call. These guys have been doing this while we've been trying to get to them. More missions. Yeah. And I'm um, like, where's Jimmy? They're like, he's, uh, we snowed him over, meaning they gave him a whole bunch of Valium. Mm -hmm. And again, this is 2010. Protocols for traumatic brain injury or closed head injury have evolved a lot since then as well. But basically, reduced stimulus. Kind of like whenever, like if somebody has a hypoxic or, or a cerebral episode, you keep them calm, you keep them cool. And our version of doing that, you know, at an Alamo outpost in Afghanistan is to basically just give them a near lethal dose of Valium and put them in a dark tent. You know, I mean, that's yeah. all you can do, you know. And so that's what they pretty much done with Jimmy. I immediately go to him. He's in a tent. Jimmy and I haven't even talked about this stuff, but, but this was absolutely the, the apex point of me being able to be there for another human being right. and mentor them in a professional capacity. Cause it was like, I, I, 
I've witnessed people go through what he was going through. I had, I had, I had not been shot in the head before, you know, but I knew what he was going through. Like, I mean, there's the edge of your mortality of, okay, do I feel lucky or should I have died or what's, what's going, you know, you're very, yeah. if you do have conscious thought. And so I just wanted to go be with him as his friend, but also as his mentor. And I knew that he was scared, but at the same time, like he wasn't being completely uh, clear with me on how bad his symptoms were. Again, it's like, you What's know, I, I'm, I'm the wasn't... coach, I'm fine. Coach put me back in and, yeah. uh, but I just, I talked But he to might him. not even be aware of totally the severity. Yeah. 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 Uh, but, you know, I just went to him and I realized that he was competent, mm -hmm. that he was processing what had happened correctly and that we needed him to get into a rotation. Cause again, like I'm, I'm coach. Yeah. So I've got to like manage manpower in this specific moment. Like that's my role. Yeah. Like, that's, that's like the, is he benched or is he? Yeah. Now like immediately, I, it, and I've seen this before where like protocols would say, well, immediately evacuate him back, back to the rear as soon as possible. Right. However, that's not realistic in the situation that we're in. And so not only is that not realistic because it's going to take away from resources to the fight. Yeah. But what it's going to do is uh, it's going to hurt him psychologically the rest of his life. You mean if, in that? If, if you take him away from that. So now he's injured. Like he didn't get back on the horse kind of thing. 100%. And yeah. I, I, I've seen that uh, in, in situations that I was a Marine with. Yeah. Immediately you have to go and face the tiger again. Go face the dragon again. Go face that. Because, because if, he, if he leaves then, then it won. That's, that's his story. It knocked him down. That's his story. Yeah. And that, 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 he has so much more capacity than that. Yeah. I just told him, I was like, clean yourself up. You're back in the rotation. And I remember there was a pause there. There was a pause. Like, are you fucking shitting me? And it was just like, no, this is, no, no. Like the, the fucking, yeah. the, dan the, the fucking dance card's still fucking happening. Yeah. And I, not, I, we fucking need you to be a part of this. And we all need a mission. We all need something like that. And I know that that fucking turned him back on, man. And, and I felt really powerful in doing that. Shit, as we get into this story more, it, uh, he absolutely saved human beings' lives by yeah. re-engaging in the situation. And I think that a lot of people, they're not afforded that opportunity. Yeah. Okay, so Jimmy's back in the game. You are injured, but you're not injured. Yeah. You know, and, and, and he knows this too. Like, we're not going to get people with, with a stubbed toe. Yeah. You're going to get people that are begging for their lives, being mutilated by, you know, yeah. automatic weapons and RPGs and shit. You know, and so... He's back in, he's, and I'm like, cool. I go back to the team and I, I immediately start talking to the other men that I'm managing in that space. And it was like, they all had that look, man. Like, there's no rules. There's no bullshit right now. This is fucking real. Yeah. You know, like, you know, if you believe you can help human beings in this situation, show me right now. Yeah. Like show really me. that yeah. others may live. Now, from that point that night, we created a rotation and it wasn't based off of numbers and people being rotated. It was when guys had the look. Yeah. Cause you might go on a mission and we were doing like maybe two or three missions every 24 hour cycle, but it was fucking surreal. So it's not, yeah, you're not, you're creating this rotation of going in and out of the conflict area, not based on how many hours of sleep have you had, how many, but, but really like looking them in the eye, engaging their, the trauma that they're currently experiencing and like yeah. what their capability is based on that. We're beyond pragmatics. You know, I mean, this is, there's an artistry, there's a chemistry to what's happening that you just have to involve yourself in the flow of. Yeah. Uh, when you take off, as soon as you lift out of the barrier of the Alamo, just machine gun fire. Yeah. And what they're trying to get you to do, they're trying to be like, no, no, shoot at me. Right. Shoot at me. It's all very coordinated. The people up on the mountain are coordinating with the people at the, because they know where our helicopters are at. Yeah. They're trying to fucking mortar them and rocket them, you know, because if they keep us from going to get them, more of them fucking die. Yeah. But at the same time, this is for the bigger context of the story, for them to fucking down a pave hawk, that is the coolest thing that could ever happen. Right. That's jihad at its finest, you know? And, and so we have to realize that we, we've got the prom date. Yeah, we're we're fucking you know the prom dates with us the whole time and that's that's their golden fuck that that everything everything that shoots shoots at a pave hawk when it comes into a, ha a hover you know yeah. I mean that's just it's just the hottest chick in the room you know it's yeah. just, you're getting all the attention, um, 
But yeah, so we're rotating one or two guys. This goes on with Bulldog Bite. It was supposed to last three days. Right. And just to kind of give context to the story, like now we're five days in. So Jimmy gets shot in the head five days into a three-day operation. Five days in, and we're going three or four takeoffs yeah. every 24-hour period, but into the the most chaotic, surreal experience that you can imagine. So you take off from this situation we're talking about. You fly over to this stuff, and you're immediately flying into guys that are dismembered, dragging their dead buddy to you in a firefight. Yeah. And you have to hoist down in the middle of this to deal with it. And if you're not the one that's hoisting down to get these guys, you're in another helicopter circling overhead, engaging the guys that are trying to kill and overrun the people that are on the ground. Right. And uh, that's a very tough space to be in mentally all the time. And, I, and when you're doing this day in and day out, most of these missions would happen at night. Yeah. And so when you're flying into this stuff at night, you're very sleep deprived. Like you're maybe getting an hour or two here and there, Yeah. you know? And when you fly into that stuff, you're in such a strange state that I remember flying into stuff and I'm like, why are these guys hanging out at campfires? Cause I'm on NVGs, you're flying yeah. in, and you, but those aren't campfires. Those are secondary burns from artillery rounds, oh, hellfire right. missiles. Yeah. Or RPGs that are burning the trees and shit around these people. Right. And I'm like, well, they're just hanging out by a campfire. Why? That's really undisciplined. But yeah. they're, they're not. These guys yeah. are fighting for their fucking lives. But again, it's not that I'm just some macho asshole. It's because it's happening at a volume that I ca you can't process as fast as it's happening. You know, it's, it's happening to you quicker than you can consciously interact with it. And the shit just haunts you. Yeah. I mean, whether it's, um, you know, you're pulling in a mutilated body or you're dragging and, uh, you know, you're dragging mutilated remains to the helicopter and you put them on something and they're hoisting up just 10 feet above you and the piss and shit from that dead body comes down on top of you. And maybe for a moment, it reminds you of changing a, a diaper of your kid. And it's just, it could be something like that. And you will be underneath that helicopter in that situation with tears running down your face. It's so intense, but it had only been, we had only been on the ground for like 30 minutes and you get a nine line that day. And again, we were probably like five days into it. I, I don't remember exactly, but. What's a nine line? Real quick, so, so yeah, like a nine line is this basically brevity code thing that tells us who, what, when, where, why. Okay. They need us. Yeah. And it, it's a nine line because there's nine fucking lines to it. Yeah, and yeah. this one was different because when it came out, it said armed escort required because we're, we are our own armed escort. Like when you use the term Pedro, yeah, we have 50 cows, flamethrowers and all kinds of hate machines that are going to protect yeah. us. Suppose, you know, like, you know, the things that we were, we can inter operate autonomously in this environment, but it's saying what it's saying is no bring in an Apache gunship. It, it, that's, yeah. that's the way you can read that. And the significance was there were two killed in action. There there were like two or three people that were critical and what we called cat alpha, like like 30 minutes, they're dead, you know, they're dismembered. And and so I immediately run out to the aircraft and it's it's a real blur when these things happen, Scott. Like it, it, it uh, I'm looking at where this is at. I'm looking at where the enemy position is. I'm looking at all of this information is getting really processed very quickly. And we take off with two helicopters and five PJs. And so within five minutes from me reading that piece of paper, we're airborne. We've taken off and we're flying directly to that site because this one seems more urgent than the next. And in the five or 10 minutes that it takes us to get physically to their location, the voice on the radio has changed. And there's absolute panic in the voices in the men that are speaking to us on the radio. And I have the ability to talk directly to them. And I don't because you want, it's all about awareness. And so there's a lot of techniques that we're using. So I allow the helicopter system to be the channel that we're all listening to everything. And I can choose when, where I, I choose to do this. And so I, we want everyone to be on the same awareness page. And so we take off. And as soon as we take off, the gunners have to test fire their 50 cals just to make sure. The 50 cal is a, a very uh, uh, brutally effective weapon. 
uh, but it was designed in World War I. And it really hasn't changed much after that, uh, but it's an open bolt machine gun. And so basically you wanna test it out to make sure it works correctly before you really are relying on it. And, and uh, so they fire those weapons off. And as soon as we took off, I realized that they're not just test firing. They're shooting, I mean, as soon as we took off. And so there's people immediately shooting at us as we took off. And, and uh, so I'm not only sensing that, and I'm flying with my feet over the edge of the aircraft with no door. We have doors on them. So once we get casualties in there, we shut them so people don't fall out of the damn helicopter. But when we go in, everything's opened up. Yeah. And there's people shooting at us immediately as we take off. And I, I, the only reason I was aware of that is because the gunners are not just going, go, 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 go. You know, they're like, go, 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 go. They're, they're really engaged. And you're like, wow, this is okay. That's weird. That hasn't happened thus far, you know. Uh, we, anyway, we fly to the site and you can just see shit fucking happening. And it's line of sight. Like it might be 10 miles away, but you can see once you take off two, 3,000 feet up into the air, you can see where you're going. Because there's tracer rounds flying up and everything. Uh, not necessarily tracer rounds, but you see smoke. And like, just imagine if there was just a fire on the side of a mountain somewhere. Right. You know that that's where we're going. Yeah. You know, like when 30 people are, in, are lobbying, like lob lobbying machine gun fire back and forth, it, it, it resonates not in sound because remember, I'm in a helicopter. Yeah. It resonates in dust and you just see dust and the insurgents are ingenious with it. They'll lay down wetted cloths in front of their machine gun so it doesn't kick up dust. Wow. Because they know that's all we're looking for. Yeah. That Apache pilot, he's just looking for dust. Okay, hellfire, release, boom. You know? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and we go over and we circle because we're trying to figure out again because we're only as good as the information that we can interact on. And the solid information that we're gaining is changing rapidly. Not only have we loaded the aircraft, taken off, test fired, return fire, flying at specific coordinates that are input into these navigation systems, but now everything's changing. Hey guys, so I'm doing a podcast and it's a new vulnerable project that has flooded me with gratitude for all the people that have come on this show and chatted with me and gotten tattooed by me and all the people behind the scenes that made it happen and absolutely for you to have the curiosity to click on this thing and listen this far like I thank you I'm also super grateful to factor meals um, one because I eat food every day and they've fed me through this whole process but also because they believed in this project and said yes to it when it was just an email it didn't even exist it was just an idea and an email and they were like yeah let's let's get behind this and they're giving a discount to podcast listeners that's you so if you want to try them out and support the people that support this thing you're listening to right now head to factormeals.com slash stupid things five zero and use code stupid things five zero to get 50 percent off your first box plus 20 percent off your next box that's code stupid things five zero and you go to factormeals.com slash stupid things five zero to get 50 percent off your first box and then 20 percent off your next box while your subscription is active and um yeah help keep gas in the tank food in your stomach, and the whole dream alive. Spin your passion into a business with Shopify and break sales records with the world's best converting checkout. Let's hear that one more time. The world's best converting checkout. Shopify's legendary checkout makes it easier for customers to shop on your website, across social media, and everywhere in between. Now that's music to your ears. Any way you spin it, you can be a smash hit with Shopify. Start your dollar a month trial today at shopify.com slash records. So we took a little break. Braj is putting more fire into the sauna. And um, just sitting here, and looking at around the doorway to the sauna is this sort of like pattern of of symbols and and things burned into the the frame of the doorway 
and you can see there's there's little carvings and names and insignias of all the different people that have sat in the sauna with him over the years. I can't help but feel what a parallel universe Raj has lived in and marvel at how much our lives overlap now. Like how, how much this man has come to mean to me and the idea that we both grew up in the South in not ideal circumstances and found our ways out of it. You know, he joined the military as a way to kind of, to find some firm ground to stand on. And, you know, I ran away to San Francisco and started tattooing, which are opposite directions. But the fact that the universe brought our paths together and we're now sitting in, in the sauna in Alaska, kind of reminiscing on the last 13 years of our life and, and how much we've come to mean to each other now it's really powerful and it, and it really reminds me that anyone you meet, any hand you shake, don't take it lightly, you know, like see every person that comes into my life as an opportunity to learn something. And it just goes to show me that, you know, of all the hands I shake in my lifetime, you really never know which ones are going to be the ones that change how you grow from that moment forward. Like I, I had no idea that Roger would come to mean so much to me and I would learn so much from him. He redefined what it meant to be a man and it changed who I have become since then. It changes the way I, I parent my kids and it, it changes the way I value what I have and what I create in this world. The fiercest fighting was November 14th. The situation was, was changing so dramatically and that made all of the hairs on the back of, all of us were like that sixth sense immediately perked up. Not just me, but the other men in the back of the aircraft with me and the pilots. Is that because you're, you're all listening to the feed from what, of what you're flying into? Yeah, yeah. And it, it, was just, it was really bad what we were dealing with in the days upcoming to this. But this was like a whole other layer that was like, holy shit. Like these guys are, you're listening to people die on the radio basically. Yeah. And, and uh, there's some complicated things tactically that don't matter to the story, but they matter to the flow of what happened. But uh, the Apache gunships were in there doing stuff. And there's a certain thing of controlling airspace. And so we weren't entering the exact airspace, the, the AOR, like the area of response. We weren't going directly in there. So we went and again, we're flying with very limited, limited fuel to get to that altitude. I think that right. this one in particular was like 7,300 feet, which is the lunatic fringe of the helicopter even being airborne. And the consequence of limited fuel is how much time you have time, to spend time, there. Time, fuel, yeah. all of it. And and uh, so there is there is an orchestra of things that are taking place. The pilot immediately realizes we don't have fuel to affect this because we loitered for five or 10 minutes as this is changing because we're trying to understand how to interact with this the best because the one rule that we have is don't make the situation worse. Everything that we do, make it better. And so we don't, we're trying to figure out how to make it better. But like, like if you're trying to tune and up a car- being worse would be you guys going down there so they have to send more people yeah, to come get you. Yeah, now we just show up and then now we're just part of the problem now. Yeah. And again, we're listening the whole time. And I mean, we're like- I mean, you realize like this, like you are about to get put into a meat grinder. And so we're just listening, 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 listening. And in my aircraft, it was me, Koa, and Ted. We take off and we fly and we go fly directly to it. And at this point, I mean, I, I've already unclipped. Like there's nothing holding me in the aircraft. I'm just running around the back of the helicopter. It's, it's a small space, but I'm on my knees and I'm, I'm a big old tall giraffe of a human, but I'm interacting and, and you're just trying to figure out how this is going to go down. And we flew into it. And so as we fly over the exact grid coordinate that they came over, as soon as we start slowing the aircraft down to do a clockwise circle of the area, just to get awareness of what's going on in the ground. And this is nighttime, morning time. What, give me the, it's, it's like five or six in the evening. Okay. Got it. Yeah. It's like five or six in the evening. The sun's just going down. And I realized that this is going to get nasty too. And so we have brevity. And so I tell everybody, not only my aircraft, but the other, there's two aircraft. Uh, 
and it's called lead and trail. And I'm in the lead aircraft and we never put the lead aircraft in unless it's, we don't understand. So now we need to get on the ground and figure it out. And so we're going to do a leader option, the lead aircraft. My aircraft is going in first so I can get on the ground and try to get some sense of what's happening. It's obvious what's happening though, but there's no, it's, it's moving too fast. It's moving at a pace that, that you realize that there's no control. And uh, so we take off. And so we're into that bank. And as we start banking, the aircraft will slow down. And these pilots, uh, the pilot that was flying for my aircraft is a guy named Marcus Maris. And, uh, and these are some of the best pilots in the world and uh, the crews as well. And so like we, as we're doing that, they're, they call it, they're, you go into a low energy state. So a helicopter is a weird aircraft in the fact that the faster it's moving, the more energy it has to maneuver. That is, if it moves slow, we've all seen helicopters in a hover. It can't interact quickly right there. It's like a right. Winnebago with three flat tires. Like it's not moving fast at that. It doesn't matter what you do. It can't, it can't react quickly to what's happening. And so we've decided we're going to do a leader option. We've decided that we're going to put our aircraft PJs on the ground via hoist. And that's just a simple, like, you'll be flying in, and you're just like, uh, leader up. And everybody's like, okay, boom, trailer comes up high, and then the leader goes down low to go in. And so now the, the, the trailer aircraft now is providing cover, and you're it's just like that. It just happens, you know. And that goes off the spidey senses of what we've discussed years before. Like, I don't know what's going on. I don't trust what's going on. We need to get control. When that happens, it's the leader. The yeah. leaders get on the ground, you know. So. That means me and Koa are going to hoist first, followed by Ted. And I don't even bring medical gear. Like, this is literally just my weapon and my body getting into the fight, you know. And as we start slowing the aircraft down in this counterclockwise circle, we're looking down at the ground. And uh, this is the same year that multicam, the, the multicam pattern was released for coalition forces. And that shit works good. And it's like, I, you literally can't, you, someone could be, you could be a hundred feet from someone, you don't see them if they're not moving. Yeah. But someone popped smoke and I saw a purple smoke. And they'll usually do that to let us know, okay, this is where I want you to hoist guys. Yeah. But as soon as that happens, the purple smoke, I mean, you just see machine, machine gun fire guns fire. fucking yeah. up the, the, the point of origin of the purple smoke. But what was very unsettling also, and this is all happening very, very, very fast. At the same time, I'm getting ready to hoist out in the middle of this, so I'm physically climbing out of the helicopter on a steel cable. It's just orchestrated very, very succinctly. And I see the purple smoke. I go off communication so I can't talk or hear what anybody's saying, but I'm just going to point where I want them to hoist me to. And so I find where I think I'm going to survive this and I point down. And the guy that's on a machine gun up front takes over the controls to a hoist cable myself and a partner of mine are on this hoist cable. He can't see anything because my body's blocking him. As soon as we slow down the aircraft, as the aircraft slows down to begin hoisting us, tracer fire starts ripping through the cabin of the aircraft. And I mean, a lot of it. This looked like a rave, man. I mean, it was like there's chem lights ripping through, going through the aircraft. And for every one like, of those, there's five bullets that, that aren't tracers. Yeah, and so are... like not only going through the open spaces of the aircraft, but going from the bottom, like ripping through the bottom of the helicopter and stuff like, like yeah. we're, we're getting shot at. And, and, uh, usually insurgents don't shoot tracers out of AK 47s. That's out of belt fed weapons. So it's, it's a, it's a technique used for belt fed weapons to help walk the targets where you want to hit to aim. Yeah. And they're, they're hitting us in the heart of the aircraft, like where I'm at. And I knew, I just, I was like, we have three seconds to live. Like, I'm going to die in three seconds. And the three seconds just kept coming. And I screamed to everybody in the aircraft, we're, get, we're taking fire because Koa, my partner, is connected, but his face is in my chest body armor because we're about to go down the hoist together. And uh, he doesn't see the tracer fire. And then he sees my eyes. And... Obviously, the pilots are aware that we're getting shot at, but it's almost like, hey, guys, if you don't know it, you know, this is really bad. And uh, anyway, they start hoisting us. And as we're hoisting, 
you could feel percussive forces outside of the, the scream of the engine and outside of our helicopter returning. Like I'm two feet away from a 50 cal machine gun that's going at a cyclic rate. Beyond that, beyond the, the, the 120 mile per hour wind and the scream of the turbo engines, I can feel percussive snaps. From bullets whizzing by. Just all over you. Yeah. And, and uh, as we're hoisting, I'm just, I wrap, I'm, I'm a tall, lanky guy, and I wrapped every bit of me around my partner because I'm like, I'm just going to shield him. And I'm just holding him as high as we can. And, and uh, at some point, I see the ground coming up. I did feel like we're on a, a steel braided cable that's like a quarter inch thick. I remember it was almost like it had, like I could feel things happening to it. Like, Right. Whether there were, it was the aircraft like moving, but it was like being jostled at the end of a rope. And I didn't know what that was. And we were hoisting down about 40 feet, probably like 40 feet down to the ground and very uneven ground, very steep. But it was in this small wadi bowl. We were in this, like it was a small bowl in very steep terrain. And I'm coming down. And so I, I with my long legs, I, I kind of point, you know, you kind of pirouette your feet out to kind of stop the spinning. And stabilized before my other partner gets on the ground. And as soon as my foot touched the earth, an RPG had been shot at us. And it was just like a lightning bolt that came at us and impacted 20 feet from us. And the pressure wave from it knocked me and my partner down on top of each other. And it happened so fast, I knew it hadn't hit the aircraft, but I knew that it could have been a dragon that did it. Like it was, but it was, happened so fast. It was like, holy shit. Like, and anybody that understands that's listening to this, there was one thing that was really interesting that we had done that week, talking about just how desperate and, and intentional we were and uh, things leading to that week. I had taped the hoist cable open. So there's like a, a carabiner that that steel cable is attached to. Right. And we took all the safety pins out of it and literally just duct taped it wide open. So either I'm on it or I'm off of it. There's no clicking. Yeah. It's just you're on it or you're not. And I remember we fell to the ground and the cable just came off of me and my partner. And I mean, it makes me emotional thinking about it. Just humanity and, and love of brotherhood. But that hoist cable laid next to us for the next like two or three minutes they weren't going to pull it up because they're like... Because the helicopter's still hanging they, there. They thought that we had been possibly killed by that RPG because when it goes under the helicopter 40 feet... They can't see. They, they just... It just yeah. goes off. And, and they think that we took it. And so I just jumped on the radio. I'm like... And now I'm on my radio to them. Yeah. I'm like, I think holy shit is the only thing that came out. So now they know I'm alive. Yeah. And uh, now we're underneath this helicopter... With the intensity and frequency of all those bullets, like, like they sat there in that hailstorm of bullets for three minutes. Rock solid. Until they knew you were okay. Rock solid. They're not going anywhere, So man. they're like, if, if, it, if you need us, like, we're here. Like, we're going to, I'm going to get shot. That helicopter, man, didn't move. I mean, it might have shifted an inch one way, but it's just dead above us, you know. And right. And just that feeling of connection of just being like, if you get, like, we are in this with you. Oh, yeah. Hunt. It's not like, holy fuck, they're down. Let's get out of here. Ride or die, bro. And like, that's what, look, we're that's what, that's what looking down at that, that rope. <sighs> yeah, the emotional meant. connection to that was my salvation. Like, yeah, that was, that's your umbilical cord. Like I mean, fuck, that's the rock of ages. That You're just, yeah. it's like, fuck. Yeah. And uh, to understand, so like that RPG just went off and we're concussed, man. And you do really autonomous things that you don't even know. And so I was somewhat aware of what was taking place, but my partner, Koa, jumped to his feet like to fight and I did everything. And he, he's a real strong dude. He's a real big power lifter guy. You know, and I'm just this tall, skinny dude. And I'm like pulling him as hard as I can to get back down on top of me. And so I kind of like, kind of like pull him like down on top of me. And immediately when he falls on top of me, we start getting lit up by machine gun fire. And it was dust. It was dust beyond what the helicopter was producing. It was shit that was hitting all around us. And it was so difficult because you couldn't see, you couldn't hear. You couldn't speak. And the machine guns on the Pavehawk opened up. And the machine, like a 50 cal casing is heavy. And so like if they're falling from 40 feet down on top of 120 mile per hour wind, like it'll give you a black eye if it hits you in the face. I mean, and these things are- And they're are, hot too. They're, they're scalding hot, you know? Yeah. And so these things are raining down on top of us. 
And anybody that's been in the infantry has had automatic rifle casings go down underneath their body armor. And, yeah. You know, you call them casing tattoos or whatever. They, you get them all over, but these were 50 cows. And I remember they were just falling all over me. And it was a moment of just strange eloquence. But it was like immediately I started crying. Because I knew that someone, the, the intensity of which they were doing that, they're killing people that are trying to kill me right now. Yeah. And so again, it's become so emotional. Like it becomes this deep end of the pool emotionally. Like every emotion you have is happening. Every emotion that you have is happening every three seconds. Horror, grief, love, sex. Horror, grief, love, sex. It's just all happening at once. And, and, I think tears just started just emitting it from my face like a faucet, knowing that these guys are, they're nuking motherfuckers. And I mean, the gun on the right, they still maintain their exact attitude. Um, and the, the aircraft was just holding and the right gun shot all of its ammo. Like I know that it's got maybe a minute and a half of ammo. Just go, 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 go. They shot all of it. And I was just like, oh fuck, you know? Yeah. And and the casings are coming down and that hoist cable was just right there. And I was just like, God, still sitting there for you. Yeah. For this aircraft to, to leave, it has to fall off the mountain. And so if this is like the just mountain. Just to get momentum so it can maneuver. Like if this is the helicopter and we're like here, it has to do this thing like this. It has to go like this, fall off and get going fast. And now the speed of the descent rate gives the props right. angle. So basically the, it just fell off and now it goes completely silent yeah from all of this fucking rage and lust and hate to nothing and uh they left but they were out of fuel they were out of ammunition and they had taken s significant battle damage to the aircraft you know because it's just shot the fuck up you know and just like we bleed blood and we yeah. have blood pressure that aircraft has hydraulic pressure yeah but they were what we call bingo they can do nothing they have no fuel no ammo all it's going to cause now is, again, we only make the situation better. It's only going to make it worse if they stay there. Yeah. They have to fucking leave. Yeah. Before they lose radio contact with this, he's given me awareness of who yeah. the greatest threat was. So 100 meters away, when they were shooting at that, that he was telling me what that was. But they're, we're in death laid to them shooting at us. So as long as we don't stand up, we're not going to get killed. Right. And uh, but they, the reason that crew serve machine guns have worked since World War I and arguably even before that, but uh, they suppress you. So they keep you from moving. If you can stop someone from moving, now you can maneuver on them and kill them. And so that's what they're trying to effectively do is like, if I can pin you down where you can't move or you don't think you can move, we can move. Then you can flank, they can flank you. Yeah. And, yeah. and usually it's, it's called a base of fire because... When you're shooting a crew serve machine gun, that's this base of fire that's chug, chug, chugging away. While that's happening, there's a maneuver element that's trying to maneuver on you to find that angle. Now you're looking, now I'm going to get you here, you know, and so. So you guys are people, sitting there taking machine gun fire and having to stay down, but you know. They're maneuvering. They're intelligent enough that like while you're sitting there, they're, yeah, they're closing there, in. There's, there's other factors involved in this too. You know, like there's a limited amount of ammo that you can fire. The only thing that we can do is run to where we think the casualties are. Yeah. We do no good by ourselves here. Yeah. We need to find the friendly forces. And so that's my job. Is, is And I'm like this way. And so in between this stuff, I think Cole was on his radio. He was trying to get like an antenna or something set up. Like we have omnidirectional satellite antennas. And now we're not line of sight with our guys because we're trying to update them. Mm -hmm. We have blue force trackers and all these things. I just get up and start running. And I run towards where I think the casualties are. And I run like bear crawl run uphill to where I think the casualties are. And as I get close to them, again, they're wearing multicam and it's really hard to see. And as I get close to them, I'm probably within 10 or 15 feet of three men is what I see. I see three men huddled around like a small mesquite tree above me, but I'm running up the side of this cliff to get to them. RPG detonates the tree that I'm running to. And it just blows that tree apart. That the guys are huddled around. That they're huddled around. And uh, it blew me back. And I just immediately reflexively hop up and run to where they are. And again, the, where that tree was and where they were laying is slightly indefilate. I use that yeah. term. They're just slightly lower than the, the direction of the, the rocket propelled grenade. 
And as I run over to them, I get back up and I run immediately to them. The one guy's screaming at me, get down, we're taking fire. And I was like, I, I saw the whites of his eyes before that RPG hit. Yeah. I ran to him and there was a man next to him that was wearing a helmet. And the helmet had been ripped off of his head from the RPG blast. And his face was kind of fucked up. And the guy that was talking to me was laying there pissing himself like just just uncontrollably but he was so concussed like you don't even you know it it was just to be alive at this point again i mentioned before like every three seconds it was just as if this is the last three seconds of your life every three seconds yeah and to this point that was so surreal to watch that happen and i couldn't hear anything couldn't i mean you could barely see it was as if you took like gravel from like a dusty road and just filled your mouth with it like you couldn't speak and a lot of that could be from adrenaline you know just that 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 uh sympathetic you know you know parasympathetic response of just pure adrenaline you know yeah. uh, i didn't even treat these guys like i mean they're obviously dramatically injured and i'm not even at a point where i'm in a space to treat them you know i don't even have my medical ruck it was yeah. on the aircraft and i came down and so we have things that they're because you were just coming down to scout yeah, well, and then, then the second because ship, we're under fire, the 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 last man basically him and he brings medical gear. Yeah, but as a PJ, I mean, like you spread load stuff. We term use the term spread load where you spread things out on your body. And I have battle packs, and battle packs consist of like uh, like Hemcon dressings, like they can stop arterial bleeds, tourniquets, fourteen gauge needles for pneumothorax. All kinds of shit. Like, I've got three or four of these on me. So we go to this site. These guys are fucked up. The RPG just detonated. Now, these guys are are not that they're any less by any capacity than us. But these guys are beyond their resolve and intent. Like, these guys are fucking panicked. They just, they, they've been in this situation for over, you know, five days now. The last hour, all their buddies are getting mutilated and being fucking killed. But these guys are fucked, man. You know, they're foobard. Like, I mean, this is this is really beyond control. I'm like, where are the fucking casualties? What the fuck's going on? And at this time, there's a lot of things that start happening very quickly. Like, Koa's job is to coordinate aircraft. I'm there to engage with the guys and save their lives. Now, Koa and I can both switch those responsibilities, but those are the roles. That's the hats we're wearing right yeah. now. And, and and that's the gear you're carrying. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so he's got communication quick he's, he's dealing with all that and i'm trying to get with these guys but it's happening so quick but i realize i can't speak and koa in his drop bag where you like you throw grenades or fucking whatever it's like a little drop pouch he pulls out a bottle of water and he hands it to me and now koa had never been in direct combat like this now i, I had experienced combat but again what we're experiencing now uh is beyond anything that i think is really describable like it's that intense and He hands me the water bottle and I take the water bottle. I coolly uncap it and I drink it. Now I'm laying down against rocks next to these other guys. And these guys are looking at me like, who the fuck are you guys, man? Like we're just drinking water. Just having a tea break in the middle. One of the guys uh, is screaming and he's crying and he's, he's like, you fucking coming in. I knew you motherfuckers would come in and fucking PJs. And he's like smacking me on the arm and stuff. But I mean, again, it's just, it's every emotion that you can experience as, as, as a human happening on a, on a fucking Ferris wheel. It's just going and going and going. And at some point, Koa is getting the Apache aircraft to come and help us. And the Apache aircraft is much different than a Pavehawk. A Pavehawk, they circle over our heads and shoot things. They, they orbit over us and shoot things. An Apache has to get a bearing and fly directly at us and shoot things. That it's got to fly right at you. And so that takes 10 minutes. And so in the moments that this is happening, again, time's completely irrelative. It's that time compression. It could be, it feels like an hour, but it's five to 10 minutes, you know, and, yeah. and, and uh, uh, somebody dives over this hill. Like we're over this knoll and, and there's, there's cruiser fire and there's RPGs bouncing off of this small knoll that we're all by where the, the tree got ex- detonated with the RPG. And so those are bouncing off and detonating around us. And it's really you just, you're so by yourself that it's a very lonely, horrific feeling. 
Like, you're going to die right now, you know, and these are the fucking assholes that I'm going to die with right now. But there's a very endearing thing that to where it's like, all right, man, like we are going to fight to the fucking death right here. You know, and you're kind of, I'm kind of drinking that water and looking in these guys' eyes like, okay, like this is good. And as that happens, a guy yeah, dies over the hill. I don't know if it's an enemy, but it's coming from where that fucking shit, that the, all the hell is coming from. Again, the, it's coming from multiple directions, but this is the most of it is from right. And anyway, yeah. this guy dives over there and he's, uh, it looks as if he's been shot in the jaw. He's bleeding from the mouth and he dives into us like a fucking wild man. And, and, and uh, we're just existing in this moment. And he grabs me and he's crying and he's fucking holding me. He's like, fucking PJs, fucking PJs. And, and he's and then he starts going off. He's like, I'm going to fucking kill me. This He's talking about this officer. He's going to kill this officer. He's just, but he's just he's so out of mind. Yeah. Uh, and then he's like, do you have a smoke? And I, you, I, I talked about it earlier where you have like these signals where you can pop smokes. Like you can. Right. So I have green and red smokes. Now those to me, like if I, if for some reason I lose communication with aircraft, these mean things. Yeah. And I'm like green or red. And I've got them dummy corded on this belt where I can just like pull it off. It's just, it's rubber banded. I pull it, yeah. pull a pin, it's gone. You know, yeah. it's, it's happening. And you want to be very careful because when that goes off, one, it means very specific things. Two, yeah. it's letting the enemy know I'm right fucking here, man. Like, just yeah. come on, daddy. And he's like, I need a fucking smoke. And I'm like, Green or red? He's like, no, 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 because no, I'm, I'm ready right now. Yeah. I, you know, I can do this for you right now if you want this, you know. And he's like, uh, no, a fucking cigarette. <laughs> and I'm like, are you fucking kidding me, man? Like, and so that was just, that was very surreal. Like, I've never experienced this level of disintegrated reality. Yeah. Where this guy's asking me for this. And anyway... His hands are shaking like he's he's shaking like so uncontrollably, and I'm just like I grab him I'm like where's the fucking casualties man, and he's like over the fucking knoll over the hill and he's pointing where he just ran from and I'm like yeah. let's fucking go yeah and he's like we'll all fucking die, and I don't understand I, I but in this conversation that I'm getting into now is a source of a lot of these I have really horrible nightmares about this specific this feeling of this moment. Because ever since I was a young boy, I'd have these nightmares of like an overwhelming force that's just the death crawler or something like that. Yeah. Like I have no question in my mind, if I was to just get up on my knees and look over there, I'm dead. Yeah. Yeah. The amount of dirt and shit that's coming off of that, and it's just three feet above where I'm at, yeah. to just look at it, to, to siren song Odysseus look at that, it's a round to the fucking face. Yeah. Or worse. And the only thing that I'm thinking about, and I don't want to say that the whole time that I'm experiencing this, that it's, it's, I'm selfless, but the whole time my, I'm speaking a mantra to myself, make it better, make it better, make yeah. it better. That's all I'm saying to myself. And so I have to get to the casualties and make it better. Cause my role, my little fucking trucker hat that I'm wearing is to save everybody's fucking life. Right. And well, take, they, I mean, you had already, you know, in saying that, you know, Prior to that, you've already accepted your debt. You know, and you're, it's one you're thing going to into it and be like, I'm dying and now. Even, and even in that, there's moments where there's powerful conviction to it. Yeah. And then a moment later, it's it's a thought of a child or a, a childhood memory or of a parent holding you. Yeah. It's guttural. I mean, it, it's it, it and it's cyclic. It's it's it's. Uh, but anybody that's experienced any horrific trauma they know this feeling and and, and uh, but it's like i am there and my job is to make this fucking better and and uh co is like inbound and that means like he's calling in some kind of fucking hate like he is just okayed something that's going to change our next move right so he's like uh patch he's hellfires inbound you know and because i'm like what we're all yeah. dealing with this and and uh and everybody's now glued to koa and as we fucking he said that uh, I look out to the middle of the valley because we're 7,000 feet up in a, the lowest portion of this valley is 3,000. And we're set, we're, so we're 4,000 feet above. Right, in the middle of this. Where the ground is. And so we're on the side of a mountain. And so as you look out into this valley, the water per valley, 
you can see a soda bed. You can see maybe Joyce if you kind of came around the corner. But what I see is I see an Apache helicopter coming right at us. You can just, you just, it's in the blue, in the setting blue sky kind of thing coming yeah. at us. And you saw, I saw two puffs of smoke. You didn't hear anything. Yeah. And again, we're getting shot at, but you just saw like, 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 yeah. and it was the, I mean, man, I can't even fucking bring it justice, but those things were fired right at us. Like, and so what's difficult with those systems, they have really great optic systems and weapon systems, but they have to see what they're shooting at. Mm -hmm. There has to be line of sight to what they're shooting at. And so they basically come from 10 nautical miles out and just fly directly at you. Right. And the situation is so chaotic that there's enemy mixed with the dead. Now, we didn't, I didn't know this at the time. I, I didn't consciously understand this, but you could, there were no clear lines of friendly or enemy. Yeah. And how are they targeting? Like, is Koa calling it in? Co is basically clear, like basically giving them danger close, cleared hot. Like, like so right. the pilot's like, I, I can't see. He's talking plain English. And, and he's like, just shoot at our location. He's like, I can't. I, I, he's like, can't identify, can't identify, can't identify. And then he just says, weapons release. Like he sees something. And he's like, I'm killing that right now. And yeah. so, and this is a hellfire. And there's rock arets. And there's a term that's called terrain shielding. So like, for instance, like if a grenade went off, on a, in a flat space where you're next to it, it's going to kill you. But if you're around a corner and a grenade yeah. goes off, you're going to get concussed, but it's not going to kill you. Like that pressure wave has the ability to gelatinize your organs. Yeah. But if you're terrain shielded from it, like it really does unexplainable things. I mean, physicists or people that are into this shit could explain it, but when you're terrain shielded, it changes that radius. Right. This thing's fired at us. Two of them. Puff, puff. At JCPenney, we make fashion count for everybody and everybody. Get pieces that fit and flatter at prices that feel good. Mix easy on cargoes with breezy tops or polish your look with soft suiting. Step into JCPenney brands that get you like St. John's Bay and Worthington, each in women's petite and plus sizes too. Guys, you're good to go in brands like Mutual Weave, J. Farrar, and Stafford. Style and comfort for all, even big and tall. Here, spring comes in all shapes, sizes, and colors. JCPenney, make everybody count. I've listened to Roger give the official account of Bulldog Bite and, you know, read the reports that they had to fill out on the way back. But um, hearing him speak emotionally about it, you realize like how powerful that experience was because it's not, it never loses its impact. And even sitting here watching him and seeing his body language and seeing him go through the feeling of being there you realize like it's that experience is is a part of him it's just interwoven with his being on a cellular level this thing's fired at us puff puff and as it gets closer the sound's catching up so but it's traveling faster than the speed of sound i would right. think you know but you can hear the servos shifting the missiles wow of it coming if it's steering itself. Yeah. yeah, bro. And it comes at us. And at the last minute, it goes right over our heads over to the, the great nothingness. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, you don't even hear it. You just feel it, you know? And yeah. it was just like uh, a just smack. A it just, it just hurt. All of it just hurts. It was like that. And then rocks come, rock and debris and shit starts dumping on us. What happens in combat like that, the, the ebb and flow of combat when big booms happen, everybody stops shooting. And so it's just like, boom, and then whenever the hellfire went off, it was followed in succession by another one, but the lull, it was like, as quiet as just nothing. Just silent. You could hear rocks falling down. And then the same thing, boom, and just complete quiet. And it's almost as if everyone's like, like checking for their wallet kind of yeah. shit, you know. And uh, uh, Apache gunship is firing missiles yeah. from 10 kilometers away. And then you have the big boom. Yeah. And then you have 30 seconds to do whatever you want to do right there. You can jump up, you can do fucking jumping jacks. You yeah. can drink water, stand up, but nothing's happening for 30 seconds. So anyway, so our Apache's leaving. That was just like, well, God damn. All right, you know, so... 
And then the F-18 checked in and then uh, Koa tells me, he's like, uh, F-18, basically saying they have like a 2,000 pound dumb bomb that's on, wow. you know, yeah. it, it happens to have a 2,000 pound GBU, yeah. whatever that is, I don't even remember. If you drop that, honest, we're dead. Yeah. But this is very desperate, you know, and, and now when those left, it was literally like Koa and I, you know, like holding each other, crying, like, I mean, like with these guys, you know, and, and, uh, and the amount of fire that we're receiving, it's like these guys own the day. Like we, we're not stopping them with what we're doing to them. He just looks at me and I was like, just, just drop it. Just fucking drop it, man. Right. You know, and, and that's all we got because my M4 is not doing anything. And uh, the machine gun volleys and stuff are getting closer. They're maneuvering to it. And you so can't- you know, you know that they're closing in. You know that they're flanking it out. And you're just like, drop the bomb because at least then they'll die with us. Yeah. And, like and, we're all going. And this, it's not as like martyrdom as that. It, right. it, it felt that way. It really did. But it was like, Raj. And I was like, yeah, 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 yes. And, and, uh, and because when they do that, if it's within what they consider danger close, yeah. which isn't like automatic death, but it's like potential 50-50, yeah. you're going to die. Yeah. But with the the GBU, it's like, well, okay, so I want your last name and I want your last four because this yeah. is being recorded. Yeah. You know, that they're doing everything in, in clear conscience. Like this yeah. is yes. And so uh, we do that. And then it's like, okay. And then Coe is like inbound and you can hear them and they, they have terminology. It's basically, they fly over you to target. They will not release the weapon until they are on top of you or past you so that it goes past right. you. And so th we all know this. And Because uh, if they push drop when they're exactly over it's you, gonna go past then you. it'll fly. It it'll, never yeah. hits you. Yeah. And we have all kinds of devices on us that put out, emit signaling to this right. aircraft. They don't have to see us. Right. The sun's going down at this point too. Like it's, the sun is just like E-E-N-T. Like it's just passing. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so, so they, they drop the weapon, and uh, but they, they do the thing, they, they say, in the pop. And so the, what the aircraft does is it flips upside down to see us. And it stays right, as soon as it sees us, like within the next five seconds, they're releasing this thing. Is, yeah. You can't, there's no taking it back. And so they're in the pop. And then as soon as you, the controller, see them and you think that they're over you, you say cleared hot. And that, then they flip, they, they flip over and release. Wow. So in the pop, I hear Koa say cleared hot. And then we all just like lay down together and uh, just the earth open, you know? And, and it was, they dropped that thing. It was probably, who even knows? It might've been a quarter mile away. Yeah. And it was in a ravine a quarter mile away. Yeah. But they obviously saw something there, you know? Uh, but that thing hit and it was just like, like nothing mattered anymore. And I stood up and I just ran towards where I thought the casualties were. Cause it was like that boom happened and it was just like, we're going. And Koa had out these satellite antennas. So he wasn't ready to move. And I hadn't even thought to tell him that I'm just going to go for it, man. Yeah. You know? But I knew after that one, like shit stopping. It's hard stopping for a minute, you know? And I got up and I ran. And as I got up and ran, I ran face to face with an insurgent. Like there is some kind of, combat and, yeah. and uh it's really difficult because just being a stupid american like anybody that's not white they're their combatant you know and it could be a civilian yeah but any you're guilty where we're at like you're guilty yeah. by association there's none of that morality that's taking place but i ran into another human being yeah and this guy was already fucked i mean like he was on the other side of that when that went off but he he was kind of standing up days and but i ran i was, I'd probably ran like 20 feet when I ran into him and I was as fast as I could animalistically sprint, bear crawl, run towards where I thought these guys were. Yeah. I ran into him, just, just hit him. And we fell, both fell down. And again, Ko is probably 30 seconds behind me now because he's got shit yeah. and he has a, a backpack with a really sexy satellite communication device that he's talking to all these people with. And anyway, I just go. I don't even, I don't deal with this guy. Right. I just know in a minute, my day's going to get really bad again. And so I'm just running as fast as I can. I mean, literally like for my life, you know, yeah. like, and I'm running. So like when I get to where I was running, just, you know, less than a hundred feet from where we were, 
when I get to that site, the earth had been cultivated, cultivated by HE, like high explosives. Like oh, it was, okay. it was turned. The soil was turned. It, yeah. And we all know like, that was smell. That from, yeah. And if you, and if you just grew up in a city your whole life and you don't know what that smells like, like go to a farm and when they till the soil, smell yeah. it. Like it's, it's almost like sweat. Right. It's just, uh, there's a humidity that comes out of the earth when you till it and it creates this. It's this, that like damp iron kind yeah, of Yeah. And yeah. that was mixed with high explosives, like, yeah. like cordite, like you could smell it and it was just cultivated earth. Yeah. And the first person I came up to, it was just so surreal. It was so, I was in disbelief at what I saw. The first person I came out, I noticed that I was running in tilled soil, but it was from the explosions. And I get to the first person and he was facing me and his legs were turned around backwards and his armor had been ripped off. Now, I don't know if someone had taken that off, but like he was, he was mutilated and deformed. Yeah. And he was looking me right in the eyes and he was just breathing like, <laughs> and just reaching out to me. Yeah. And I reached out and I grabbed, I, I, I held him. And uh, I must have held him for like 20 seconds and I didn't, I was, I didn't know what to do. I was just looking at him. And uh, I was just, I was just in shock. It took me a moment to realize I'm supposed to treat him. And I immediately like looked at him and the side of his chest, it was the side of his like right underarm there was a hole that you could fit your fist into and I could see his lungs breathing. Like, <laughs> and I could see inside his chest and I'm, he's looking at me, just trying to hold me. And every time I'd get close, he'd pull me like on him, you know? And uh, it was really hard because I had to like hit him, like hit him and push him off to just to try to look at him. And, and uh, I had those battle packs and one in the battle pack. So what the only thing I can do to treat him is to close his chest injury. And the chest injury was larger diameter than the hyphen dressing. And so I just stuck it inside his chest cavity, like yeah. between his skin and his ribs, but it was just sitting there. Yeah. And I didn't know what to do. And so I, I had a, a, a fentanyl lollipop and I put it in my mouth and I chewed it up and I spit it out and I put it in his mouth. And I'm like, fucking, I'm like, chew it, chew it, chew it, chew it, just swallow. swallow. And, uh, but he, he just spit it all out. I mean, he's just, he's breathing and just trying to fight me. And, and, uh, I realized he had uh, uh, an IFAC, a first aid kit yeah. on him. And so I took that and, uh, it, but it was just kind of like, shit was just strung out. Like someone had treated them at some point, but shit was just everywhere. Yeah. And uh, there was equipment everywhere, like rucks ripped in half. Went up to uh, another guy and another guy was laying down on his stomach and he was repeating the Lord's prayer loudly. It was weird. And I looked at his hip and his hip, it was pink froth. Like his hip had been hit with, like when you have really horrific trauma like that, sometimes the bone and the meat mix into one thing. So people see it when they hunt a lot. Like if you yeah. hit bone, it turns into a pink thing. It yeah. doesn't bleed. Right. Because it's so traumatized. All of those arterial agents are so traumatized and percussed and, and inflamed and traumatized that it doesn't bleed. That like coagulated It's just foam. a big puffy broccoli looking thing that's pink. And that's what his hip was. And I'm like, okay, I don't know how to treat this either, you know. But he, I'm like, and I do remember like just through my training, you know, we treat, you know, the way that we train is airway breathing circulation. Like, do they have an airway? Are they bleeding? Stop it. Circulation, you know, treat those wounds. You know, it's like, because if someone's bleeding out, they're going to die of shock really quickly. And so those are the only things I can really do is treat their airway, treat hemorrhagic bleeds and cover them up the wounds, you know, and get them out of there. That's all I can do, yeah. you know. So I went over to the next guy. I noticed there was a guy that was talking to me over in the corner and I'm, I'm low crawling up this ravine as I'm moving through these casualties. And I noticed there was a guy upside down in a tree, like in a mesquite tree, like he's upside down yeah. In this mesquite tree. And his legs are shaking. They're just shaking, like like really like like a neurological injury. And he's shaking, but he's eviscerated. His hard organs are out of his body, but he's upside down with his face towards me looking at me. Oh. And uh I don't know what to do. I just grab him and I pull him towards me, but 
I can't stand up because we're getting still shot at and everything. And I, I pull him and he kind of falls down on top of me. And he's like, he just says, I'm cold. I'm cold. And I don't know what to do. And I've lost track of Koa. And so I crawl back down to where Koa was because now there's that first guy. And I check on the first guy. Yeah. And the first guy, uh, he, I go to him and he starts grabbing me again. And he starts grabbing me and grabbing my face, all of my gear grabbing me. And uh, I have to hit him a couple times. And I'm, I'm emotional at this point. And he stops breathing. And he's just looking at me. He just stopped. And, and I don't know what to do. I, I literally, I'm, I'm hitting him in the face and trying to like, come on, motherfucker, breathe. And I'm just, yeah. and, I, and I bet I'm hysterically crying as this is happening. And uh, Koa is probably like 10 feet from me. And he's like, Raj, Raj. He's like, get out of the fucking weed. He's just screaming at me, like, fucking stop. You know, and, I'm, and it was, I needed to hear that. Yeah. And I just shut his eyes. And like I, I held his face and I just shut, I, like I shut his fucking eyes. It seems so cliche, but that's what I did. And I, I didn't know what else to do because what I'm trained to do is not fucking working, right? And I went up to the guy, Lord's Prayer, same thing. I took the treatment shit that I, from him and I took it back up the hill. But even when I say took it, I just rip it out of these people's hands and bodies and shit and drag it and... I I'd also meaning stuck, you took the bandage out of his out chest of his cavity chest, and, and like brought it back it. to the next guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and uh, we also I also decompressed his chest like six or seven fucking times. Yeah, but he's got an open chest cavity. But I'm trained to de if you to have penetrating trauma, you decompress. And I'm just going down unsuccessfully everything that I'm brainwashed to do to people. And so I've got a 14 gauge needle, and I, I decompressed the young man that died on me right there eight times. You yeah. Know? And even in the uninjured side, I'm doing everything I can. But he was the first fatality that we were in my arms and he was physically fighting me the whole time that he died. And that was, and no matter what anybody says, like you're implicated in that death. Like, like when someone dies begging for their life, like, and you're supposed to fix that, you don't, it's like, you're implicated in that. It's real heavy stuff, yeah. you know? I mean, I can talk about it now. I used to just delay discussing this stuff, but, uh, I think it's important, not out of a voyeurism perspective, but out of a human uh, understanding, you know, a catharsis of this whole thing. Lord Prayer Guy, still Lord Prayer Guy. Next, uh, the, the, I went back to the guy in the tree. I make sure he's down. The problem when you have evisceration is those heart organs dry out really quickly. Because they're outside of your body. They're, yeah. 10 minutes, now it's necrotic tissue. It doesn't yeah. come back to life. Now he's going to die of organ failure. So right. it's like, it doesn't matter if I save him. You have to get his organs wet and warm again. You know. So yeah. what you do is you just, you kind of like hunch over him and you grab the, the cavity of the body and you, you pick, this, it, the, pick the stomach muscles up and you shake it and they all just kind of fall back in. Wow. And they, it works. Yeah. We had done it in training grievously enough to animals, you know, yeah. and I'm doing this and it, it worked and I'm like, holy fuck, you know, and uh, so all his intestines and everything then fall back it just inside goes back his in body. but yeah. but if you ro roll him sideways it's all just going to come out again you know but yeah. it's there you know and he keeps saying i'm cold i'm cold and there was a young man next to me i didn't mention it but there's a young man with a machine gun with a 240 golf and he's just telling me what the enemy are doing like we're still getting maneuvered on yeah you know? they're, they're still doing this but now it's dark and it's dark and it's below freezing a moon come out too it's full like bright illumination yeah we're above it's freezing and the sun just went down and the, the the insurgents get really scared to fight us at night because of the spooky inspector and the predators like that hellfire is going to just hit you man you know right. you're not even going to know it's coming you know or the 180 round 105 or whatever spooky spectra hate they got up there you know waiting yeah. for you because of they, all the thermal and they, they're like, they're and like, like fuck it let's just we've done it right yeah but they, they, they there's still guys hanging on yeah and the fact that they were still maintaining rates of fire it was just baffling me that like you can't fucking maintain this amount of fire just because of the, the amount run, of ammunition yeah. Run out. And, yeah. and uh and it was sporadic but it wasn't they have a thing called fpf in ground combat it's final protective fire so like yeah. if you're being overrun you shoot everything and that's why the yeah. army guys had shot everything uh but they were disciplined and still engaging us wow. they were probing where we were and where they could move to us you know uh I think the only thing that kept us alive was just how difficult the terrain was. Like, yeah. you can't just go from here to there. Yeah. I can keep shooting at you from there to there, but to get from here to there, that's an hour away. Yeah. 
you know, even though it's just, you a, have to walk all the even way it's just a hundred feet away, you can't just do that. Yeah. You know? uh, uh, went up to the guy up in the tree. His name is Carl Bilby. Carl Bilby's still alive today. I don't want to ruin the story, but uh, he was a uh, police officer working, doing like, there's a lot of weird CIA contractors that work with ground combatants to put in sensors in the ground. Right. And he was monitoring these sensors and stuff. There was a lot of weird shit that was going on out there. Yeah. So a lot of times, you know, like we have technology. Wait, you said the guy with his guts disemboweled. Out. Yeah. He's, he's, put his guts he's, back he's, he's, he's other than military. Wow. And I know because he had like, he had a beard. Right. These were conventional army guys that we were with directly at the time. These are 101st Airborne guys. Yeah. And this guy had a beard. I was like, what the fuck? You know? He's kind of like me. He's kind of like, he's not in regs. He's not, Yeah. he's older like me. You know, it was, it was interesting. You know, most of the army guys, you know, most infantry guys are young. They're in their twenties, you know, mm -hmm. this guy's, you know, forties, you know, um, sorry, Carl, if you listen to this, maybe in the thirties, I don't even remember. But he's it, it like, he's, he's older than he's yeah. senior then. And he's grubbed, he's grubbed down and stuff. Yeah. It was really weird. And, uh, anyway, so I treat him and I noticed there was a guy speaking to me over in the corner, not only the guy with the machine gun, now they're out of ammunition, yeah. but he's telling me what's going on. And there's this other guy that's talking to me. And, I, and um, you know, at some point I went over to the machine gunner. I was like, hey, help me. Cause I, I found another guy on the side of this, this little trench kind of ditch that we were in. And he was just talking to me real calmly. And I went over to him and I cradled him in my arms and my hand went in the back of his head. Oh. And that really, really affected me because what was interesting is the other guys were violent. You know, they mm -hmm. died violently, but this guy was very peaceful. And he was just kind of like speaking in tongues and kind of just kind of talking to me. And I hadn't even thought to treat him. And this is how fucking crazy all this shit is. And I just go over to him and I go to cradle him. My hand went through the back of his head and I'm like, oh, God damn it. At this point, I kind of lost myself in kind of like rage because I'm really failing everyone. And, uh, I set him down. I went over to the guy with the machine gun. And when I say went over, I just crawled over 10 feet over to him. And I'm like, hey, motherfucker, come help me out. And he wasn't talking. This guy wasn't talking to me anymore. Not the guy missing the back of his head. Yeah. The guy on the machine gun that was been that talking. That was giving you updates. Yeah. yeah. And and I go over to him. So I crawl on top, like on the side, like I'm going to like spoon with him. Yeah. And I throw my leg and I knee him in the fucking thing. Because I'm wondering why he's being so quiet. And yeah. he doesn't move. And I rolled him over and his face had been caved in. Uh, and it had been caved in, obviously, with an RPG, but I don't remember. This guy was 10 to 15 feet from me. Right. And I don't remember that. Like, I have no recollection of... Of an RPG RPG detonating up. in this moment in time. But yeah. he was talking to me. Now he wasn't talking to me, and his face was complete. Like, his nose was in the back of his head. Yeah. And it wasn't from the RPG. It was from a rock or something from the blast that caved his face Some in. Some kind of shrapnel or something. Something caved his face in. And... I completely lost it, man. And I just, I was so bloodless, like just fuck it. And I grabbed him by the feet and I pulled him and I was lower than him. I pulled him down on top of me because part of my job too is I have to collect everybody in a pile. Mm -hmm. We call it a CCP, a casualty collection point, right? That's the, the fucking pretty name for it, but it's a pile of fucking moaning and dead people. And so I need to get them all together because I'm one person and I can't, do things if guys are spread out. Whether that's take off treatments that I was treating a guy with and now put it on the guy that's now dying, whatever. Yeah. Uh, I haven't even mentioned there was another gentleman that was screaming the whole time, screaming. And he was down by the Lord's Prayer guy. He's fucking screaming, man. I mean, like, if you took a chainsaw and cut his fucking foot off with a chainsaw, yeah. he's screaming like that. And he's doing it the whole time. I'm up above these guys now and I want to collect them downhill where Koa is and where the first guy died. And I'm beyond myself. And I just stand up, I grab this guy, pull him down on top of me and we cartwheel down because it's very steep. We cartwheel kind of down to where Koa is, but he gets hung up on like a rock outcropping and the moon was out. And when I had been pulling him, his body armor pulled up on his body and not only did the feed tray hit a 240 Gulf, which is a, a like an infantry crew serve weapon that shoots belt-fed machine gun ammunition, and it fell open and the feed tray fell open. There's no ammo in it. 
and that really haunted me. But I looked at his body and his body was riddled with holes from the RPG or like, yeah. like rocks that had penetrated not only his body armor, but his body. And when you, when you say that empty feed tray haunted you, you mean because he was sitting there, he was empty killed. Weapon. He was killed manning a machine gun that didn't even have bullets. And he's, he's laying behind it because he doesn't know what else to do. Yeah. Like a lot of times Instead of in taking trauma, cover and then move, yeah. They, you just, you, you get stuck in, they call that OODA loop. Like you, whatever you're doing you think is productive, you just keep doing that till you die. Yeah. And that's what had happened to him. But with the moonlight in his body and the injuries was just horrifically haunting. Like it's burnt into my fucking DNA, you know? And, and it was just, he was so pale. Yeah. And anyway, I dragged him back down and I pulled him and I put the bodies over top of the guys that were alive. Just as cover. Uh, the one guy that was, I, I was doing something that, there, there's a couple moments of lost time for me in here. Like at some point there was a young man that crawled up to me in my lap and he was, he's like, I'm dying, doc. He did, he was just calling me doc. And he's like, I'm dying, doc. I'm dying, I'm cold. And I pulled open his, like what he was, his body armor, blow his body armor. And as I opened that up and he's laying in my lap, it uh, it was just pulsing venous blood out of like a hole, like the size of like a silver dollar out of his abdomen. And it was just pulsing. I didn't see any other injury yeah. on him. He didn't have, a, if that was, I guess that was the entry wound, but there was no exit wound. Huh. And he's pulsing venous blood, like, like, I mean, just pouring out of his abdomen. And uh, he was cold. And he died at some point within that exchange that we had. And I drug him down. When I say drag him, I'm just low crawling, dragging him on top of me until I get him in a pile down below. And then I took his jacket off and I gave his jacket to Carl Bilby. Because he was, he was, Carl was still alive. And the, the guy with the Lord's Prayer was still alive. And at some point, I mean, this is maybe an hour or two hours into this whole ordeal. Like I stopped. I couldn't treat them anymore. I, I didn't have anything to treat these guys with in the helicopter. No update when they were coming back. There was pot shots being taken at us. Like they were pop, 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 pop. But what's yeah. really interesting, and this is only occurs to me in this conscious thought, is possibly they were waiting on the helicopter to come back. Right. Because they left us and there's all these wounded guys. The helicopter has to fucking come back. Maybe that's why they're hanging out. I don't know that yeah. why they, they, it was going And the helicopter is the, the holy grail. That's, that's what we want, man. Fuck yeah. these guys. Bring this is just to get the helo in here. Yeah. But, you know, it, they were still shooting at us. It, it, it really diminished since the sun went down. But there was still like grievous, like surreal threat around us. And I ran out of things to do and I didn't know what else to do except start telling horrible fucking jokes to guys, you know. <laughs> These guys have died now, like three guys have died in my arms and it's pretty bad. And uh, guys are decompensating, you know, they're, they're kind of at the point of death. And, and uh, I'm like, uh, don't worry, man, in, in 20 minutes, you're going to be finger banging nurses. You know, I'm just like, they're, I'm just trying to do something. And the one, one guy, the guy who's repeating the Lord's Prayer, he was like, my wife won't like that. Like he was, but he was, he was saying it in a very direct way. Like he's trying to connect yeah. with his wife right now and i'm ruining it for him it was just like i is and I, it made me feel very self-conscious like i'm just fucking this up that much more right and then at some point with my stupid fucking comedy routine i realized the screaming guy is not screaming and it just it just these weird conscious thoughts happen and so i go over to him and i realized that he had been shot while he's in our pile wow yeah 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 because he 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 had been shot like, and it was through the side of his body armor. Yeah. And so I don't know how long he hasn't been breathing. Cause I just realized he hasn't been screaming. Yeah. And again, more failure on my part. I go over to him and, uh, he was choking on his tongue, but it wasn't because of the thing they teach us. Like it's the tongue. It was the fact that the fact that it was positioning the muscle of his tongue was like spasming to the point it was occluding his was, airway. Okay. And so I had to stick my fingers in his mouth with all my might, push his tongue down and it, <gasps> he would start breathing. But only right. when I did that, if I let off, his tongue would go back through so his So he mouth. could consciously breathe, but he couldn't get his tongue out of the way. Yeah. He couldn't breathe. Wow. And I'm like, what the fuck, you know? And so in between all this, I realized that he was, he had been shot in the chest. And again, I assume that it happened when he's in the pile. Yeah. So 
I decompressed him. And you can always tell that it's legit when you decompress guys with a 14 gauge needle multiple times and they don't, it doesn't change anything that they do. Yeah. I mean, you're shoving that big pin into their chest multiple times and they're just like, you're just doing it to them, you know? Yeah. And uh, they're just dead weight. And so I'm doing that. Uh, and, but the only thing that helped him was for me to stick my fingers in his mouth and press his tongue down and he's breathing. And then Koa, it's like 30 seconds out, Raj. I'm like, what? He's like, our guys. I'm like, what the fuck? Anyway, so this is happening. Okay, we're now giving them numbers. Yeah. Uh, four heroes, four deceased, four to five WIA, Cat A, let's fucking go. And they come in and he's like, where do you want them, Roger? So he's trying to tell me where I want them to hoist. Yeah. Because you can't land. And so I'm like, above us, like, no shit, you know, yeah. like, you, they're not coming uphill. You need to come downhill. And anyway, so they hoist them in. And it takes them longer than I fucking care to fucking remember. But it was like five minutes, which is way too long in my, yeah. my mental state. And in fact, when Brandon came to me, I mean, I fucking slugged them. You know, but it's just like to understand how intense that moment is. It's, it's like you're meeting me after I've died. Yeah. And so now... You're coming into this, but in their defense, they came down and they fucking cartwheeled, hooked together yeah, with a litter and they're not dropping it. And they cartwheeled down like 20 feet down to where we were. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Connected together. Yeah. And they're like, where the, what's fucking, where are you, where, what do you need, Roger? Just fucking, I'm just like, I'm out of my mind crazy. And I immediately direct fucking Jimmy hold his fucking airway open. He won't, I mean, I'm just screaming, fucking thump. I'm like, fuck, I'm just fucking like this. And he's like, okay, okay, okay. And so that's our cat. That's So we're prioritizing the whole time. Everybody that's living and dying, like who's going yeah. first? Like when, when the Rose of No Man Lands comes, like who's going first? Like you have to have, and it changes every fucking five seconds. Like this guy's not breathing, this guy's here. But it's like you rack and stack. All the deceased go last. Yeah. You know, they're going with me, but the living tissue goes with you. You're fucking number one. And, that, and so we, we train for this. Like, it's very orchestrated, very Super Bowl fucking clutch play. Like, it's like one, two, three. Like, and you're pointing to people. Like, you go first. So, like, when that whatever helo comes in, you're getting on it with this motherfucker yeah. and just go. And so uh, if it had not been for Jimmy being there at that moment, that he would have died. Yeah. That guy would have fucking died, man. Like, without a question in my mind. Because we had other shit going on. And he was just one. And, and that was a very powerful moment. But uh, me and Stimke took Carl and we had to, we used different litters. And the simplest of litters that we had there at the moment was a Stokes litter. It's a big like rescue high angle alpine basket that you see when people are lifted to helicopters. It's a metal, this one's titanium. Like I said, price has no fucking, it's, just, it's titanium, yeah. state of the art, super litter. Uh, of, of interest, we also, we have a thing called a speed ball. We're all out of ammunition. We're all out of everything. Uh, we have speed balls, which have, it's full of ammunition, Red Bulls, 40 millimeter grenade launchers and grenades. It's it's the bag you want whenever you're, you're getting overrun. Yeah. You know, and so I have them drop that, but in the middle of the night, 50 feet away is, it doesn't exist. And so yeah. they dropped it 50 feet away. I'm sure there's some fucking Afghani kid that has the pack and everything, you know? Yeah. But that was lost. And then Stimke asked me if he wanted me to go get it. I'm like, none of it matters. Like we have to leave, you know, none of it matters, you know? And, 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 uh, so, but we wanted the other guys cause we're not taking the whole platoon. There's a platoon and a company of men around us. Yeah. We have to let them know, Hey, this is for you. Find this fucking shit. You're going to want it. You know, yeah. uh, this is all happening very, very quickly. And Brandon and I have to put Carl in a litter and Brandon and I, under nice conditions, we can put you in a in a Skedco in five minutes, and you you can hang off the side of a cliff. It's you know you're you're comfy. Yeah. But in these conditions, it's really hard, and and uh, we get them in there. But it was difficult to say the least. We drag everybody. Everybody's co-located. We're ready to go. We start getting racked and stacked, and two helos take the casualties out of there. One of the things that struck me in this moment was that how obvious it was for Roger to stay on the ground. Like that helicopter, the, the lifeline that brought him there, in him putting casualties on it and sending it away, there was never a moment of like, 
I wish I was on there or like, this is my chance to get out of this and maybe live another day. It's just understood that he is on that ground until everyone is accounted for. Just the sense of duty and how ingrained it is in these guys on a cellular level, like in the same way that I would take a breath, these guys walk towards imminent death and danger. And it, it, there's no sense of self. There is only sense of the mission, which is to help these guys. And then we're waiting. Now it's quiet again. Like they were shooting at us while we had the heels, but it wasn't like before. Like you could tell like they're just out of ammo. Like they're just, they're trying to get us, you yeah. know. Um, but uh, we evacuated those guys out and you start doing number counts from the people on the ground that can talk to you. At some point there were men from the platoon that were coming to help me. And they're like, what do you want us to do? I'm like, just fucking sit here with these guys. But they would break down crying. Like they would ask me what to do, but I'm asking him to go drag his dead buddy over here for me. And it's, yeah. and it's, it's fucking, it's, it's, it's really intense. The gravity of that is, is, is powerful as someone shooting at you. It's really, I wasn't sensitive enough to think about that because I had objectified what I was doing or attempting to objectify. And then all of a sudden, Brandon, Brandon's always squared away. He's like, Raj, Terp. There was an interpreter that had his foot blown off. I haven't treated him. Yeah. He's in a rice paddy squat next to me the whole time. And I didn't know he was fucking there, man. Wow. And he's, he's, so he is an Afghani commando that is a linguist to be there to interpret with us if we run into civilians or enemy. Yeah. And they die much at a higher rate than anybody else because they're like, hey, go walk up there and tell these motherfuckers are about to die. You know, <laughs> that's this guy, right? Yeah. Anyway, this guy is a good human being, but I haven't even treated him. Yeah. And he's so quiet. And so still, I didn't even know he was there most of the time. Wow. And uh, anyway, um, so we hoist up the four guys. And these guys, for the most part, all of them died in my arms, you know. And, and we've been down on the ground for an hour plus. And when that happens, people, their, uh, their smooth muscle, their smooth organ muscle relaxes. And so the piss and shit starts coming out. And so we have to hoist them. And the pilot got as tight as he could get to the us and the rotor blades hitting the cliff. But so it's just like 10 or 15 feet. So it, it's still a hoist. And we're putting two dead guys at a time in the Stokes litter to get them in. And now that's almost unmanageable for the gunner to get in the aircraft to dump the bodies out to give it down back down to us. Right. It's really hard. And 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 because that's 400 pounds, one man is trying to manipulate with one hand in and out of the aircraft. It's, it's impossible. To dump it out, unload these dead bodies, two and then dead to get bodies more. at a time. We have to get seven people in the space of three, yeah. you know, and they're, they're dead bodies. Yeah, you know? like that dead weight. And is so we get this in, we're getting pot shotted the whole time. And again, you just feel and see the shit around you, even in the night, you know, like that. And uh, But anyway, uh, all right, so Brandon goes up with the turp with the guy. He's missing his fucking lower leg, Yeah, you know. We haven't done anything for him. Brandon and him hoist up. Brandon starts treating him. I have no question. I think Brandon's a far better medic than me. You know, I mean, it's just, I'm just Mr. Metaphysical guy. Brandon's that guy, you know. And then me and Koa ride up. And it was really tough because when we got in there, the first thing I saw was Parch's eyes. He's looking at me. And I can just tell that he's just like, the fuck, man. Yeah. You know, and, and anyway, so like, and so Parcha is helping them pull the dead bodies in there too. Like I said, it's impossible for one guy to do. So like they're manhandling the mutilated remains to get in there just so we can all get in the back of that aircraft. And, and uh, when I got in there, there was no place for me to sit. And it was just fucked up because I felt like I belonged with the dead bodies. There's some weird sub psychological stuff here, but I, I sat on the dead bodies. There, there was really no other place to sit, but I remember sitting. I mean, I imagine even though they're, they're dead. Cold, they're cold blood. Yeah, soaking into the back of my pants as I'm sitting on them. And it was just so fucked up. And even when we were getting in the helo, their piss and shit was just raining all over. You're yeah. getting sprayed with it because they just release everything, you know, about an hour or so after death, you know. Um, we flew them down to Asadabad. Yeah. There was a moment I think that we should articulate. In the back of that aircraft, in that three-minute flight, just in that whatever that three-minute flight was from where we were to Asadabad, uh, we're flying and it's just a controlled descent crash. I mean, you're basically flying like five to 10 miles, but you're losing 3000 feet. So you can yeah. see down where you're going and they basically just 
controlled just chaos crash yeah. that thing down to the pad i mean th there's procedures and they're professional they know what they're doing but they're just like let's just go yeah in that time that that's taking place i plugged into the ic the, the icf the, the inner communication thing in the aircraft because they need to know with the team leader like we're good we're accounted for yeah there could be, you know, whatever, whatever the, the subjective information, they need to objectify it right there when I get on board. And so I plug in and I'm talking to him. But the pilot is making a joke to the gunner. And man, I got enraged where I wanted to kill the fucking pilot. And I'm trying to climb up to the pilot to fucking kill him. And I'm, that's how out of mind yeah. I am. And what it was, I didn't know this, but the gunner had stopped talking because he helped pull the mutilated remains in. And right. he just, and they're, they're, when they're in that, it's like uh, left good, right good. You know, there's all these things and he's not talking. Yeah. And he realizes that he just Because he's fucking, just in shock as well. He that. just got fucked up. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know that. You know, and I'm like, you're just trying to make light of this fucking shit. Yeah. Let me fucking tune you up real quick. I'll show you where this is fucking funny, man. You know? Yeah. There's nothing rational about my state of mind. In fact, so after we dump, dump the bodies off, the surgeons hug us. I just remember my connection to Parcha, to Aaron, just to always looking at him. Because he was very boyish. at was very young. Like, he represented naiveness to me. Yeah. And I'm looking at him. And we took off. And so there's three minutes. And we're fucking yeah. on the pad, standing out of the aircraft on flattened, surfaced concrete. Not getting shot at. Yeah. And they turn the, they turn the, in the back of that helo, they turn on a blue light. Yeah. And that's to maintain night vision and stuff. But to see that we're in a somewhat safe spot so yeah. they can do that. And they turn that light on. God damn, the amount of blood and shit and fuck. It was just, it was horrific. And I remember I was sliding around on it and stuff, but it was like, it was morbid. It was, it was like a Rob Zombie fucking horror. It was just, it was obscene, the amount of fluid that was in the back of that. And now our job is, is this is the reality of, of what we're experiencing that whole week. The bodies don't just go to mortuary affairs where they scrub them and clean them and fucking start doing that shit. You put them in a fucking conics box and that conics box is over a hundred degrees in the, in the daytime. You open that up and you know, you, it, there's a, a visceral experience just to being present to that box. And I was physically carrying the four men that died in my arms to throw to heave them in that box and when shut you say the door. Conics box, it's like a like it's, a casket basically no 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 it's 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 a it's a uh uh it's a shipping container okay that yeah it's a shipping container so you're just making a pile of bodies inside a shipping, in a shipping container. container and yeah. some of these people are dismembered you know yeah and and, and uh you literally are like, who, who is this part of? Yeah. Or like, what is this part of? Or, you know, but yeah, that was really rough. And it was rough because the QRF, there's a quick reaction force waiting by barrels to come and save us. Like they were there to save us. Yeah. And they're by warming barrels out on the flight line waiting for that helo. Yeah. Because they're there for like, there's nobody responding on the side of the mountain. Yeah. Get in the fucking helo. We're going to go fucking nuke this whole fucking site. You know, they're there and but they're just warming by the fire because it's below freezing and they're watching me pull these dead bodies out and like looking at me and then some of them are the buddies of the people that are dead like yeah it's really weird and the surgeons came out and they're like they everyone you brought us made it like they're trying to tell wow. us this wait just that statement everyone you brought them made it yeah they're, they're just like everybody that you fucking brought we just fucking saved them they're heading back to fucking wow. bagram right now yeah and so but i mean I'm so far gone. Like, I can't even fucking imagine that. Like, they're trying to be civil with yeah. me. And I don't, even the concrete pad you being can't flat, I'm just like, this is weird. Yeah. So it's another two minute flight from where we are to go to Joyce, where we're going to park our helicopters and literally just wait for this to happen again. Wow. We took off. And normally, like, I have a cow tail and I'll clip in. When it's just PJs flying, we have the doors wide open. Yeah. And you don't want to smell what's in the back of that thing, you know? And so, like, we just kept the doors open, and we're just going to fly, like, three to five nautical miles away. And, I mean, in those aircraft, I mean, you're just there. And I didn't even clip in. like, And do we have, oh, shit, those straps that are above the door that you're always kind of holding on to. You know, it's yeah. like a, a safe grab. 
And uh, I remember we took off in the pilots. I mean, they weren't hot dogging, but they were moving with a sense of urgency and like performance. Like they can really fly the fuck out of those things when they want to. And they were flying the fuck out of it. And when they took off, it kind of swung me around, but I slid on the gore out of the aircraft and had the grab strap and Parcha was holding on to me. If it wasn't for that, I would have fell out of the fucking helicopter. And it's just little things like that. Like I can't process that. Like that's yeah. such a moment. Yeah. Anyway, we flew back. We flew back to the, uh, our Fob Joyce, that asphalt all over there. And I looked at Parcha. I was like, Parcha, clean this for me, please. Just clean all the shit out of there. And he's like, got it. And then I get my stuff and I walk into this clinic. I remember I went in there and I sat down and I just started crying. Like I, I really started sobbing and crying. And within 30 seconds of me crying, nine line. And we flew back out. So we have to understand. Wait, is, you flew back out? You just get back, back in the helicopter and do it again. And it was, I looked at the grid coordinates and I memorized them. Yeah. And I knew that's where we had just been, but maybe 200 meters downhill from where we were. I mean, you just, you get so good at that. I'm like, yeah. that's literally just like 200 meters north of where we were, which is downhill. And you're like, yeah. there were two guys that we left from that platoon. And it was those two guys. They got up and moved down to where the calot, a calot is a term for a, a primitive structure. Yeah. It's like their houses. It's a mud mortar structure. You can land a helicopter on it. It's that strong. Wow. It'll absorb explosive rounds. Like it's impenetrable. Yeah. That is where the enemy was. And that's where our 50 cal was shooting right. down the hill of us. But there were guys uphill and side hill getting this and stuff. But... That was what the gunner was engaging initially. And so they had taken that over. The rest of the company of Buka, there, there's a platoon there. Now they're platoon ineffective. So now they have to be reabsorbed into another platoon, like a sister platoon. And so those two guys had were, were tasked to go back down and mix with the people that had now taken over that clot. Yeah. And so they were walking down that ridge line, which is, it was less than a mile. I mean, if anything, I'd say more than maybe a half a mile downhill at night and one of the guys had been shot in the throat and the other guy uh, was shot in the chest and killed. And so the guy shot through the throat is dying. We have to go get him right now. In the time that we had been there, Koa had already talked to the commanders, get all your fucking guys out of there now. You have no idea how ineffective, combat ineffective they are right now. Yeah. And so he's doing the officer thing. I'm not an officer. I don't fucking deal with that shit. You know. Yeah. But he was like, my recommendation is pull them all out right now. We'll go fucking get them on our heel right fucking now. Let's start ferrying right now. Yeah. And they locked horns. I mean, that's their secret compound. He just burged in there and fucking started tossing desks, you know. And he was just with me. This is code that was just with yeah. me through all that. So he, that's how he's emotionally reacting to this, you know. And so in that space, then the next five minutes we have a body bag that we filled with ammunition and energy drinks like rippets yeah and rippets the fuel of combat but like in the rippet is just a generic red bull like yeah. look it up but it's a form of currency you yeah. know prison has currency combat currency is rippets and so yeah. and we would routinely bring them with us because when guys are in firefights you know, like to give them a rip it or yeah. a energy bar or something like that. It just you just change their fucking life. Yeah. So we fly back over there. And we had filled a body bag with 800 pounds of ammunition, grenades, rippets. And so we flew our first pass, dropped it right on the roof of that calot, uh, 800 pounds of fucking yeah. resupply. And no one told us to do that. That was all Koa's idea. Yeah. And uh, then we had to get... Uh, the one, the deceased, and the uh, the guy shot through the throat. The guy shot through the throat was saved. Uh, but that, and there was something very interesting too that I think that's worth pointing out. Whenever I was, um, whenever I was grieving in in the uh, clinic before we had to go out immediately again, when they told me that there was a nine line, like I immediately at that moment knew there was something wrong with me. Like it's like this is where everything, all the problems start right here. You know, because it was just like, I'm attempting to come back to myself. Yeah. And then you, I, I have to shut it down. You got to shut it down. And it's just like. Yeah, because like what what happened in you when you were sitting, you're, they're like, okay, nine line. Did you immediately go back into like, okay, well, I'm on no, the Well, no, now shuffer. it's just you just feel for them. 
Yeah. And it, I almost feel like I did it because what the fuck is wrong with me? You got these 20 year old kids, their whole fucking platoon is fucking murdered and chopped up. And I leave two guys. I don't even think about them. Yeah. I didn't even think about those guys. In fact, the only thing that I fucking thought about is that I was like, hey, drag your dead buddies over here, man. Yeah. Now. You see what I'm saying? And so then it's like, it's those two guys. And it's just like, God damn, man. But I mean, that's combat. There's nothing, there's not a moral story other than just to share the truth about it. You know, and it's like, there's no more, there's you nothing. You can't create morality from it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's not, there's not a good that comes from it, you know? And, and uh, um, very powerful, man. And, and that the rest of that week, we were just in such a fog. That next morning, I think it's important to understand the next morning after these events that I'm talking about, I laid down on the rack and I just kind of laid there for a couple hours. And when the sun came up, I went and I went and was feeling the sun on my skin. Like, you know, you're like born again. You're like, yeah. what the fuck? You know, I mean, you're just, you're coming back to yourself, you know? And, and, and that was back at Bagram or, or no, out no, this there, is so. joy. We're not done. You're we still, still have m- multiple more days. And, I looked up when I, I was, I went outside, I'm feeling the sun on my skin and I look up and Asada bed's on fire. Asada bed's a fucking black, opaque fucking smoke. It's, it's three to five miles away from us and you can't even see it. It's on that fucking fire. Wow. Like it's been suicide fucking assaulted all night. Yeah. Knowing that we were bringing casualties there. Wow. They, they, I think there was like something like seven MRAP vehicles destroyed, two Apache helicopters. But basically, they take a fucking 30 guys with RPGs and fucking suicide vests, go, one-way yeah. mission. Just go destroy. Wow. Yeah. And so that that had happened. And we're, that was in the time. That's at the surgical fucking thing. Yeah. Just because that's where we were bringing them. And I've got pictures of all that shit on fire. Wow. And yeah. you're just looking at it. And you're just like, what the fuck? Yeah. That was the next morning. Wow. There was a couple of very surreal things. So when it significant events happen, like I've described to you, there's a thing within the military, specifically special operations, that's called the task force. That night when all of this is going so kinetic as it was, task force is like, we're bringing the fucking heat. They very much so believe in protecting the infantry. That's yeah. like somebody fucking with your kid. Yeah. And uh, I mean, me even knowing this, my son, Orion, yeah. You, he was. He just did four years in the Marine Corps Infantry. You know, it's like you identify with them. Yeah. So they're like, "Oh, you're fucking hurting us." You know, good fucking luck. You know, and then they bring the the voodoo weird shit to you, man. Yeah. The whole task force came down on this fucking area. And when they show up, it's it's spooky spectra, predators, you know, Reaper drones, everything. You know, and 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 uh, so everything changed. So like that next morning, not only was a sod about on fire. That was compromised to even bring casualties there. Yeah. That uh, now the task force was busy. And I think that over the next one or two days, I, it, again, time really just stopped for me. I, uh, but uh, I brought in all of our PJs. We brought the whole uh, combat search and rescue element from Bagram up there, all the mm-hmm. helicopters, all the PJs, all the yeah. pilots to come work this out, you know. And uh, we were called in. And the rangers had found a target at the end of the valley. We, we hadn't pushed this deep into the valley, but they had some high value targets that they're like, no, 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 no. We need to go in here right now. And so they, some elite ranger units went in there and just fucking, fucking dudes up, man. And then this is some of the steepest terrain I can imagine. Think of like Himalayan steep. Yeah. And there's these kalats, these adobe structures, almost like hornet dens yeah. on the side of these cliffs. And they, a, a young ranger had been shot in the throat. They were pinned down from a hornet den across the valley, shooting at their position. They're held down into a clot with a young ranger that's been shot. Mm-hmm. And me and Leo were in the other aircraft, and we're flying, and you always two ship, we're two shipping it in, and we're flying, but they'll fire what they call a SEAD mission. Suppression enemy air defense. So like basically, they're firing artillery rounds to suppress a target as we're flying into the helicopter to land. Yeah. So they're trying to mask and protect us as we're flying with the helicopter. They didn't coordinate with us. Right. And so there's 105 howitzers firing rounds through our flight path, impacting shit within 
200 meters of us with 105 rounds as we're trying to land on this. And yeah. dude, these rangers got their shit together. Trailer option, pick them up. We're going to fucking spooky. That We're going to circle overhead, killing everything that's fucking trying to draw all the fire to us. So you guys can do what you're going to do. And then you take off and we join up. And so we go high, they go low. They're going in. And as we separate, because lead aircraft is lead. Yeah. And so we're kind of, they, we're doing this thing, right as we're doing this thing like this, you literally see fucking high velocity projectiles go between the two helos. Wow. Completely uncoordinated. Right. Boom, boom. And it's blowing up. Uh, they were waiting. The Rangers were waiting for us to come in to fucking kill these fucking guys. Wow. Because they've been shooting at them the whole time. And they're like, we yeah. don't want Pedro to go down. Oh, yeah. On our watch. And so yeah. like, they have a guy that specializes just in fucking voodoo and this shit. Not what he's doing but when and how he's doing it yeah you know and it's not just a so he's waiting for them to start firing at you so that they can see they're looking oh they, they are they got it figured out but they're like wait for him to fucking get a heart on them and yeah. fucking murder him so they're like they're like literally they're like don't even he him like fucking white phosphorus fucking air burst fucking he yeah. i mean just fucking them up you know but this is happening as we're flying through this thing yeah and it was just like me and leo we looked at each other and we we're like and then again, there's these unprocessable moments. And that was 200 yards of impacting our helicopter. Like, I mean, it's flying through us. And it was just like, that just happened. So, but this is getting, getting a little bit like harder because I got so dark after that night. It was just so intense for me. We were on that pad at some point out in the concrete and rocks where you like, when you're waiting to get called, the guys that aren't on call... You're a human being. You might need to fucking strip down to your skivvies. Yeah. Rub one out. You might need to put on some shower shoes and just fucking lay in the sun for a second. Because we're trying to do this for now up to eight days. We've been doing That's this. That's crazy. Yeah. So we're in this spot now. And I've got all my favorite sniper weapons. I'm a fan of the EBR and everything. So like, we're ready now. Like, like we were kind of somewhat unprepared. But, you know, it's like we're really like hell-bent for leather now. You know, and that combat hard. Not only us, but the crews and the interaction of us and the crews. It's like... Fuck, man. I mean, we're as hard as fucking woodpecker lips. Like, you want us coming to get you, man. Like, yeah. it, it's, we're efficient and we're emotionally numb. Like, you want us, man. And in this moment, I was mentioning, it's like, this is going like eight days, you know, like every few hours, like you're on your knees crying, you know, like it's just, just weird, you know, like my gear was covered in fucking blood and feces and brain and shit. And it was just, it's really something hard to just try to maintain a sense of yourself. And, you know, and, and Leo and Aaron somehow are off together, but they're out by the helos and you start hearing pop, pop, crack, tap, tick, tick, tap, tap. And what it is, it's incoming rounds to just where we're fucking sitting. And what they do is they do what they call plunging fire. And so like, if you were to hold a machine gun up like a mortar, and shoot it, you get a lot of range out of it. But is actually lethal velocity by the time it gets to you? That's the thing, right? So, so but it is lethal velocity if it's with the high caliber. But with the AK-47, it's really just harassment fire. Yeah. And so they were doing this, and the people on this FOB, they are very sufficient, and they're very lethal in the way they have their own mortar teams and fucking howitzer teams. And on fucking a moment's notice, you got fucking Maverick fucking taking off from Bagram with the 2,000 pound GBU that's just fucking wanting it, man, you know? And so all of that happens as soon as shit like that happens. So anyway, but I'm look, I'm, I'm hearing those cracks and pops and I'm in a tent. Like we're not even in wood structures. You're in a fucking GP rubber tent and you start seeing daylight like come through the tent. You're like, yeah. oh, God damn, you know? <laughs> Like yeah, little it, holes poking through the Yeah, tent. so instantly they're like, die, motherfucker. They're playing this cat and mouse game. And so everybody just from dead silence to like the whole circus is fucking riot, you know? But what was funny is I'm looking over at fucking Leo and Aaron and they're running, bro. They're running because they were targeting the fucking helos out on the pad. I, I mean, who knows where the fuck they're yeah. shooting? Everything's kind of the same distance from that far away, but the rounds were fucking up the helos. Like they, it was fucking up the helos like yeah. going through the skin of the aircrafts and stuff wow, i mean it's yeah. just aluminum but yeah but still yeah you got a steel jacket it, around it, it's going through the fucking yeah the which aluminum. means it's going through your skin yeah and so but it was funny because leo is this hawaiian we'd always give him a hard time about being hawaiian but he's running as fast as he can and he's on gravel not just d1 we're talking big fucking chunky gravel yeah and he's running barefoot like a hundred fucking yards as fast as he can and not only is he running but he's 
he's fucking zigzagging. zigzagging. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, it was just such comedy relief. And I remember we just, we laughed about that, but they ran over to, we were and so on those fobs, what they do, they have in trenches. So when that happens, you go dive in those ditches Yeah. and it's a right angle. So everything's, you know, you can dive into it, but it's going to reflect off. You yeah. know, it's, it's, it's going to have to be a really lucky round to get you is my whole point. Yeah. But as we're in that ditch, there's like pop, pop, like around where we were. And I've got the round in, in my little dresser drawer, AK 47 fucking round. Yeah. Stuck in the stucco, like a foot from my head. It was just like pop. And it was like, huh. the, the, even the, I got lacerated from the stucco popping next to my head. Yeah. And I pulled it out. It didn't even bend the round. Really? Like perfectly it conical? Just, like every- yeah. It was a perfect fucking round. Wow. And Leo pulled it out and he gave it. He's like, it's Here yours. You <laughs> and I'm like, but it was just like that kind of stuff. And it was just, we finished up there and flew back to Bob. So, uh, yeah. After, after like, so eight days that you guys are out there. And then, yeah, like, give me, give me the, yeah, the last day. it slowly day. started kind of wrapping up uh, on the eighth day. Like I said, once the task force got involved, that day on the 14th, I mentioned November 14th, 2010, it's, when the task force got involved, it, it's, it's a pretty one-sided operation at that point. So you guys get to finally... It, yeah, it kind of started wrapping up, and, and uh, everybody had blown their wad, man. You know what I mean? And I don't care who you are, how resolved you are, like, it's a matter of now recouping your loss on both sides. Like you have to kind of shut it down and kind of recoup. And just heal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and so that's kind of what ended up happening. But we got on the aircraft and we flew back. And now we have way too many people with the amount of aircraft that we have. And it was literally Beverly Hillbillies flying back from that three-hour flight from Joyce refueling a soda bed jalalabad and then to bagram but we landed and we i immediately realized that i was not the same person we landed and i remember all of the people out on the flight line all of the maintainers that were left behind all of the people that were there were out on the runway when we landed because they knew they were just staring at us yeah and we all came back i mean traumatized and they were just kind of like looking at us you know and you know there's a lot of hugs a lot of you know, a lot of really heartfelt emotions shared there. I mean, because, I mean, just rough, man. And to go back into my space where I have a wall locker and there's pictures of my children and I'm looking at, I mean, immediate grief. I mean, just just horrific grieving of like on your knees crying. And then you just got to get back up. And, and to make matters even weirder, Uh, Lester Holt and NBC News were there because the next weekend was Thanksgiving and they wanted to have a feel-good piece because it's always a feel-good piece to have combat search and rescue in Afghanistan, bringing home the troops for, you know, and so it was like, we were immediately met with that circus as well. And it was just directly outside those walls was NBC News. Like still blood and guts on your pants, like just coming up. Yeah. Literally just attempting to articulate or come to our self like to to attempt to sail home in any way just change the course of ourselves back to ourselves and it was almost too much to bear to see pictures of my wife and kids you know to to realize that i hadn't showered in eight days but i was covered in gore i started noticing things on my jacket i had a really nice uh combat jacket uh that i i really prided myself in and it had shrapnel and yeah. what I only perceive as bullet holes through it, you know, I mean, yeah. to see uh, fragmentation and gear or things like that. And I think that's a timeless thing, you know, for people that survive circumstances like that to just run their hands over bullet holes. I found myself touching blood, like congealed blood, just to touch it, to feel that it's real. Immediately when I could, we had internet ability in the place that we were. And I looked up Bulldog Bite. Afghanistan, November 14th, and it immediately came up. And yeah. I just started crying because I needed to know that something was real about that other than my psyche. Yeah. It's really powerful. And uh, yeah. So you get back, and then ABC's, NBC is there. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just surreal. And they, they told us, well, you guys are going to fly out with Lester Holt and hoist him and do this thing, and they might want to interview. And I was like, I can't. I can't. And Jimmy's like, I'll go do it. Jimmy's like, I'll go talk to him. Like, he's always that yeah. guy. They'll go, I'll go talk to him. I'm like, I'm not going to talk to him. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, but we ended up, I ended up doing some stuff with them, but it was just, you could just, it was just kind of painful. It was just kind of like you're celebrating something, you know, like you're celebrating something that is like, not to be celebrated. Like, like parading you around and uh, yeah. yeah. But it had nothing to do with what we just experienced. It was just happenstance. That was complete yeah. happenstance. And it was just absolutely horrible timing or beautiful timing because you got to see the circus of all of it. Yeah. Like it, you, you, it was palpable, the circus of everything. Yeah. It was tough, man. That was really tough. And when we landed, it was the same day that we landed and we met you. It still hits me, just the synchronicity, call it whatever you want, but the fact that the universe put me in Afghanistan in that moment where he was just getting back from Bulldog Bite and starting to process everything they had gone through. And here I was just wandering around the tarmac outside of the PJ's unit and trying to find, you know, some way to put this weirdo trick my hands can do to use. And the idea that those guys found any value in what I had to offer them meant the world to me. I was so grateful just to have something to give. And, you know, I had no idea, but that that meeting would change the course of both of our lives. We'll, we'll get into that more in the next episode. <laughs> Waiting on a tax return? Hopefully it ends up in your hands. Fraudulent tax returns due to identity theft increased by 30% in 2023. If you're in a bind this tax season, LifeLock can help. Our U.S.-based restoration specialists are experts dedicated to helping solve your identity theft issues. And all LifeLock plans are backed by the Million Dollar Protection Package. So we'll reimburse you up to the limits of your plan if you lose money due to identity theft. Help protect your information this tax season with LifeLock. Save up to 25% your first year at LifeLock.com aware.